when people ask me so many questions about how I made it to the top, about all the times I made those deep defensive stops. They say, yo, coach, there's no stopping the juice. And when I'm on the field, I'm like a lion going loose. You better shoot me with a tranquilizer. Dog. Don't be fool, stupid. I'm not a Simpson named Bart. I'm not a cartoon. You silly bad boom. You don't like the tiger. It's the state of monsoons. Can't you see the only way I live my life is large? And I got the most games with 200 plus yards. <laughs> Buffalo is like one, two, three. When yeah. we needed a big play, the ball came to me. So all you player haters and you sucker can see. You better get on your knees and get some of these. Man, is that game? It's an easy transition. It's like a six sense or an intuition. So now it comes down to just one decision. I'll be going up the middle while you suckers be blitzing. To the 50 yard line, leaving all you behind. Then I hit the sideline. Better hit your rewind. I'm out here just to show you all. I'm as tight with this mic as I was with the ball. Oh. Rockin' the mic, you know you can lose All your rappers better run and hide The juice is up, you better recognize He's the man known as the juice When he's rockin' the mic, you know you can lose All your rappers better run and hide The juice is up, you better recognize the Sicilian, FBS. I am very grateful for Fatball and Sicilian. I'll tell you why. FBS created more channels than Comcast. Okay? FBS endorsed a lot of channels. He created a lot of channels. And I bet he can't count how many channels that he has helped to get monetized. And I'm one of them. You know, and then it's not like you have no violence on your record until you're 30, and then one night you just decide to go out and kill a cop. It doesn't happen like that. Fabrizio was always a tough kid. He was a tough kid. He had a nice punch. If he hit you, he would knock you the fuck out. I already had the position. I don't want to say boss, but that's what I was. I had the position. Yeah. I was I was made directly with New York, and I didn't have to answer to nobody in my area. I didn't watch the show so i didn't really understand the magnitude or like you know how big this moment was but you know what uh, when the nero asks to let the old lady stay yeah you know and she has to stay with the dog well god that's never started huh you know that scene and he was like Stugats. anytime i got to shoot at john's restaurant on east 12th street which was like a big mob hangout where like joe the boss masseria would like hold court and i got to work with evo nandi who played joe the boss uh, those were some of my favorite scenes. And the moment you walk in, I could recognize who's at the bar, who's at the table, FBI. And this is the first time that I meet Sonny Franchese. 
As a matter of fact, outside the Bada Bing, satin dolls, we put a curtain in the parking lot. Everyone was wondering, why is that big curtain in the parking lot? We were rehearsing the hanging scene. I'm living proof, guys. I'm living proof. I mean, no, I'm, not, I'm no millionaire or nothing, but listen, look at my life four years ago. I was in a fucking hotel. I was selling crack. I was I was snorting coke. I was drinking myself to fucking death. I was literally taking bags full of Ativan just because I wanted to die in my sleep. I was all alone, you know, and now I'm here. I have my family. I have a little bit of money in the bank. I got everything I want. And I got you guys in this channel. So if I can do it, any of you can do it. Gizzo, what's going on, everybody? Here we are. I was on time, like I told you I would be. It's a members only show, like I told you it would be. And uh, Common Sense will be here soon, I'm assuming. And any of you guys that want to grab the link and come up and debate, and I hope some of you guys do, you know, you're more than welcome. Uh, even if you don't, you know, you don't have to show your face or anything. You know how it goes. You use your avatar and uh, tell us what you think. Maybe debate Common Sense a little bit. I'm sure some of you are coming on, but we'll see. Uh, and that's all I plan on this show being as of now. We'll see. We'll see. Uh, I kind of been focused on this all day and I did listen to more OJ shit in the last couple of hours. And I don't know, man, I, I don't think I have the ability to pay attention to something I'm not interested in. I've never been interested in this case. Never really. I told you, I watched the little series they did on Netflix. I, I've watched some documentaries and shit like that, but. I don't know. It's it's not a fascinating case to me because I just think OJ is guilty. So it's like, how could you study a true crime case if you think you already know the answer? What's the fucking point? But I am open-minded. Uh, I will listen to Common's argument. Uh, but of course, you know me. No matter what I hear, I have to go check it out for myself. So we'll see. We'll see what happens. Uh, I don't see him in here yet. Hopefully he'll be here soon. Let me do some quick shout outs. Dr. Krieg, Miss Can't Be Wrong. Wisco Chick 420, thank you very much. South Philly Tony, Bobby Berberion, So BCP, Chad McDonough, Joe Root, Frankie Cicero, thank you for being a member for 12 months, sir. Cat, speaking of cat, $20 for match. Make it rain, peeps. Thank you, Kat. Hopefully we get some good donations on this show. I really hope so. Uh, thank you for the 20 And as you guys know, she is one of the biggest sponsors of this show. So you don't have much of a choice. Jason Mike Sell. Sally. Uh, yeah, Sean Landon Clark. Yeah. You're right. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to drop the link in a couple of minutes here. Uh, Michael Hensley, we love you too. That's facts, B. Did I shout you out? I'm not sure. Midwest Mafia Productions. Joe Bag of Donuts. Benny Diova. I think that's it for now. I don't know how many people we have because... It doesn't show you that on members only shows. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Benny Diova, yeah. Well, listen, he's pure evil. I talked about that on the first show, but, you know, he's the triggered one. Uh, let, let him do his thing. I don't care. I want to do this show, and I think it's going to be a lot of fun. And, and hopefully we don't even have to talk about any of that mob tube bullshit, you know? It would be nice for a change, wouldn't it? Uh, all right, I'm going to drop the link. Whenever Common's ready, he can grab it. And anyone else for that matter. I want to hear your opinions on this thing. The poll is in the chat. Let's see where that's at. The fuck? Uh, 82% guilty, 18% innocent. I saw So BCP said he thinks OJ's innocent. 
and I know a couple of you, uh, a couple of you guys, um, feel the same way. I'm trying to remember who from last night, but there's a couple of you. I'm waiting. <laughs> no rush though. See, I made a new thumbnail. Uh, it was not easy getting Common's head on that body with the suit on. It was not easy, but I worked on it for a while. It turned out to look pretty good, you know? <laughs> uh, shit. Where'd you have funny? Uh, funny. Where'd you have fun, Miss Can't Be Wrong? On Jesse's show? Who is coming on? I don't know. Common should be on any minute, but guys, some of you. I know you've been on panels before and shit. Yeah, you got an opinion on this thing. Let's fucking do it. Jeff backed out. So it's either going to be common just giving his. Uh, I don't want to say opinion because he's pretty goddamn sure, at least uh, in his mind. <laughs> uh, he'll be he'll be telling his. Uh, telling us his. Um, I don't know. Theory. Or theories. Uh, it's either going to be that or some of you guys can come on and debate them. We'll see. Either way, it'll be interesting, though, because I know Common. He'll go from the beginning of the case to the end. The Saxon. OJ is so guilty that even if another killer was proven to have done it, I wouldn't give a fuck and still hold him responsible. I hear that. Unless it was something, you know, that completely exonerated him. You know what I mean? Hey, Miss Can't Be Wrong. Hey, hey, how's it going? Good. How you doing? Pretty good. I figured I'd hop on a minute and talk with you guys about the OJ stuff. Yeah, why not? Where'd you have fun? The Jesse show earlier? Yeah, yeah. We just got over there and talked a little crap. And uh, Michael Hensley <laughs> came on with us and we talked some more crap. You know, it was oh, fun. Really? Good. Yeah. Maybe Michael will come on this show. Hold on. I'm getting a call from uh, Common here. Okay. Huh, I wonder if Common is going to back out. Come on. Hey, Antonino, how are you doing? How's everybody doing? Come on, y'all. Somebody grab the link. Somebody else. Come on. Let's talk. How are you doing? Are you here I am. I didn't mean to interrupt you. Yeah, what's up, Antonino? I have to, um, I have to, Common doesn't have a membership, so I have to text him the link. I hope this works. Oh, I hope he can still come on. Yeah. Because I know, you know, he, you know, studied this case, and I, I've heard him talk a little bit about it before. Oh, yeah, he knows his shit, you know. You know yeah, you know I watched that. it, you know, from start person. to finish, you know. Yeah. So you know a lot of shit? Yeah, I, yeah. It's just so many ways the case, the whole case, you know, from start to finish with the legal teams on both sides bumbled it, in my opinion. Yeah. Well, that's what everybody says, you know. Uh, yeah. I don't know. I mean, there's a part of me that thinks they didn't want to convict them, honestly. Well, I think Marsha Clark and – you know, Christopher Darden and them, especially him, he was green. He was so new. And I don't think that they were prepared for the celebrity of the whole thing. And there had been so much going on out there with LAPD, you know, with the police department, the corruption and all. I think that weighed a lot on it, too. Yeah, probably. The 90s, you know how the 90s were out there, oh. you know, in L.A. with, you know, all the civil unrest, you know. Yeah, fucking right. So I think Where that played into it. I think it did too, for sure. And I think uh, that jury was terrified that that Rodney King shit would happen all over again. Oh, yes. Yes. You know what I mean? If yes. they convicted him. Oh, yeah. I think they oh. were worried. And I don't, I'm, I'll have to ask common sense, but I was, I can't remember how long the trial went on, but I think, you know, the jury, I was wondering if they were, I couldn't remember if they were sequestered or not. You know, I was just listening to some interview that was done a few days ago when OJ died with Cato Caitlin. And he was, or did I say that right? Cato Kalen? Yeah, think. yeah. I think I said Caitlin the first time. Yeah, yeah. Uh, 
he was talking about being sequestered. Uh, yeah. But he just testified, right? So I don't even. I yeah, mean, he, yeah, he, yeah. Get that. But. All yeah. right. Here's, here's Jesse. Hey, hey, everybody. Hey. hey Jesse. What's going so, on? <clears throat> I just wanted to note something. I haven't gotten a chance to see it, but um, Chris Kardashian, well, Chris Jenner, Kardashian, whatever, Robert's first wife. Um, is now saying she thinks O.J. did it. Well, they were saying for years that she had had an affair with O.J. and that that, that Chloe was his. You know, I, you probably heard that, too. Yep, yep, I heard Ridiculous. that. Common's already shaking his head. <laughs> <laughs> well, everybody make your case. Go ahead, Common Sense. Go ahead. You go ahead, uh, Com uh, I want Common to start. Yeah, me too, me too. Well, I'm gonna mute out uh, this one. is what I this is what I was asking uh, FBS before I was gonna do the show with Nadu because um I, I don't know how much people know about the case and to be honest with you I don't really know where to begin and it'd be easier for for me to hear uh, what you guys think was the reason that the guy was guilty and I can explain the evidence and why you know that's incorrect that might be easier oh, yeah that makes sense instead of trying to figure out a starting point yeah. Why do yeah, you because think at, the, he's, uh... at the end of the day, the, the people that are making the accusations, just like the prosecution, have the burden of proof to prove that he's guilty. You understand? Yeah, That's yeah, true. yeah, yeah. Well, so what the, it, injuries, what... the injuries in the case were way too personal. It had to be something personal. Regardless of who did it, it was personal. Why do you say that? Um, Like... They damn near decapitated her. He abused her aside from that, you know. He was abusive oh, to her. Uh, all right, so let's so let's start there. All right, so let's start there. <laughs> you the, triggered him. The there abuse. we go. Let's start there with the abuse allegations, all right? So, you know, you guys, everybody claims that there was, you know, OJ was abusive. He, you know, had domestic violences, whatever the case may be. There was one incident, only one. There was one phone call and one arrest. And what people don't understand about that. Is do you guys know who was the uh, officer that night that 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 did the arrest from that nine one one? Mark Furman showed at one time, I thought. Yes, it was. It was Mark yeah, Furman. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah. So there was one but, phone call, and then if you remember during the trial, um, they kept saying that there were all these calls and all these reports about doing it. Well, then how come during the trial they only had one phone call and one nine one one tape from this domestic violence abuse? Come it only occurred one time. Ever have you ever been in an abusive relationship her journals came in too though her journals. oh but, but we'll talk about all this because the journals were proven uh that they were written by her sister during the civil trial really really yes. now I, I didn't know yes. that now I that know i know never that. heard yes yeah during yeah, the civil trial so i'll tell you during the civil trial the journal this journal came into uh existence and it was detailing stuff in there there was one particular one where um it was claiming that Nicole was was pissed off because OJ was trying to use some sort of blackmail because she wasn't reporting some income that she had gotten, like uh, basically from the IRS, saying she was committing some type of tax fraud, basically. And she had been served a letter by um, the IRS in regards to this uh, tax notice and an audit that they were going to do, right? Well, unfortunately for them, when they produced this journal, they didn't realize that the journal entry was written before she even got the letter sent to her in the, in the mail. So it, they, they, it turned out that the sister Denise is the one that fucking put, wrote that in there. Interesting. Yeah. 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 Then they put. Then they put up. Um, they said when they were searching the house in the in the makeup cabinet in her in her bathroom, um, where she would she had all her stuff. There was a couple photographs in one of the drawers that had a picture of her with the uh, bruises on the side of her head and and a thing on her neck and, and stuff like that. And they were trying to say that, um, you know, she detailed the abuse by taking these photographs. But the issue is, and once again, this came up in the civil trial, on the back of the picture, it had a date on it, right? And what mm -hmm. a lot of people don't know is, is that everybody knows OJ was doing movies at this time, right? Well, OJ was also helping Nicole get into movies. And OJ had gotten her a part to roll in a movie called The Abusive Wife or The Abusive Girlfriend, something like that. And the pictures that she had, the Polaroids that were in her makeup stand, were from the movie that she shot, which came out during the civil trial, that they tried to claim was was uh, was evidence that he abused his wife during the criminal trial, which were thrown out by Judge Ito because they um, they put him in there um, uh, uh, illegally without um, putting it into discovery because they found him later on. Holy shit! And it shit. was all proven to be bullshit. Mm -hmm. I can't believe a prosecutor uh, lied. 
It's oh god! Not not, not, on, not only did the prosec well, I'm not going to say that the prosecutors in the case lied, not Darden or Marsha Clark. I believe they probably thought he was guilty, um, but the police officers lied and they planted evidence, and that was proven during the criminal trial uh, without a shadow of a doubt for anybody that followed the case and knows about the evidence. I mean, we could talk about that too at some point. I'm sure. Oh yeah, yeah the cops. The cops had. I, yeah, that had everything to do with the case you know they didn't didn't handle it right they didn't no and Mar and mark Furman, you know got uh found guilty of committing perjury on the stand when he lied right. multiple times right well, mark I, was, um, yesterday, yeah. I wish he hadn't had no involvement in it at all oj to probably been found guilty if he if he hadn't because they made it all about him no mark well Furman was i don't i don't agree dirty, with that yes I, I don't agree with that particular part of it i mean i'll agree that it did you know was taken to, into account, I'm sure, but the evidence alone that they that they um, used during trial was just it was ripped apart piece by piece by the defense, and uh, we well, could get into that a little bit later. But not only did Furman lie, but if you guys remember during the preliminaries right afterwards, um, Detective Van Adder, who was one of the lead detectives for the LA Homicide um, Division, there with his partner uh, Tom Lang, uh, Judge Ito told him uh, on the stand <laughs> during the trial that it appears to me that you have a serious disregard for the truth. You yeah, know, yeah, because yeah, he did. because he lied about he lied about the circumstances involved in how they got onto his property and, and how they found the evidence, including the fact and we could get into it regarding the blood and the, the quote unquote blood that was uh, discovered at OJ's home, which I'll, I'll, well, I'll later. Let discuss me ask too. you this. What do sure. you think? Um, do you let think me just say hi to Michael real quick. Hi, Michael. Good to hey, see you. Michael. Bro. Sorry, Jesse. Uh, go ahead. What do you, I mean, the cops, the L.A. cops have always been known to be dirty, always. Um, right. So, I mean, what's your feeling on they probably botched it on purpose so he wouldn't get convicted? No, I think it's the exact opposite. I think that they tried framing somebody who they thought was guilty. And in essence, it, 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 it hurt the case well, and, and ultimately got O.J. acquitted. And I want to talk to you about those pictures you were talking about. Yes. Um mm -hmm. Kids today might not know this, but you actually used to have to get pictures developed. And yeah, when Polaroid, you send them yeah. away to get developed, there's a date on them. But they mm -hmm. come back with the date that they were developed, not the date they were taken. Yeah, but that doesn't matter, though. No, I'm just saying. I'm just making that point because you're talking about the date on the pictures. You know, those date on the back yeah, of the, the pictures... Date. The day on right. the picture was hand it was handwritten in her handwriting, not from the not from when it was Oh, it wasn't like a print I'm, of the old I'm not talking print. about okay. the one in the corner. Oh, okay. It no, had no, her no, handwritten no. Date. The date the date on the back of it, the date on the back of it coincided to the exact time. Sorry, I remember the name of the movie. It was called The Battered Wife. My apologies. Not the abusive wife, the battered wife. That was the name of it. Oh, okay. What happened to Michael? Come back if you can, Michael. Go ahead, guys. I'm sorry. No problem. What were you saying, Jesse? Sorry, I just wanted to clear that one part up. Oh no, well, I I thought you meant that you I thought you were talking about the stamped date that when you no. when they get processed. No, no, no. It was a handwritten on the back of the on the back of the picture. A lot of people used to do that, you know. They, you know yeah, post yeah, one of yeah. Them, like birthday party, Christmas '97, or you know, shit like that. Yeah, yeah. No, so, I know that, but but right. that's why I wanted to clarify that years ago, when you had to develop your film like that, it does come back with a date on the back. A printed yeah, one. It, yeah, true. It, it, yeah, it used to be in like an amber color, like orange color or something like that. Most places. Let me ask you something. The one nine one one call, is that when uh because I, I I heard some audio well, there were, or something earlier of, of OJ talking about that he was yelling and screaming and he was made out to be a monster, but he didn't want you know whores and drug addicts and shit yeah. in the house. That's okay, what that was so, about. No, no, no. That was a separate audio call. That was a 911 call um, when Nicole was already, they had already been separated at that time. She was living at the, the house on Bundy where, she, you know, the murders took place. And it was several months before the murders took place. Basically what happened is that um, OJ had found out through, you know, mutual friends that she was basically um, having these, you know, kinky like sex parties and they were drug fueled. And, it, you know, it was at the home that his young children were staying at. So when OJ found out about it, he went over to the house and she claimed that uh, he had broken into the back of the house, but it turned out that he actually didn't break in. The back door had already, be it was already broken, so to speak. But long story short, he goes in the house and he's confronting uh, Nicole about the shit that she's doing at the home where his young children are. 
And he's saying, I don't want, you can hear him on the audio tape saying, I don't want these people around my fucking kids. You need to cut it out, blah, blah, blah. And she's on the phone telling him, you know, I just want you guys to come here. I want them to leave, et cetera, et cetera. That's that 911 call. The other 911 call that we were speaking about earlier was in regards to the, to the, um, domestic violence, uh, uh, case that he wound up having to do, um, uh, domestic violence or, or classes of some sort as the, um, uh, the result, the, the disposition of that case, uh, where she called the cops because I guess they got into a verbal argument and she was going, I think at that time she was uh, taking uh, classes to get a real estate license, if I remember correctly. And she was supposed to go there that day. And OJ had previously um, two or three different times paid for her to become an interior decorator. Then she wanted to be a, a hairstylist or makeup stylist. And then she wanted to be a real estate person. So he was kind of fed up with, you know, you keep having me to pay for this stuff. You keep doing all this stuff, but you never follow through with any of it. They wound up getting in an argument and he went out to the car because she said, I'm leaving. And he says, oh, you're going to leave in my car. That's my Mercedes. So he took a bat and he smashed out the front windshield and said, well, I guess you're not going to be driving anywhere because you can't drive a car with a smashed windshield. So when she called the cops, 911 got called. And what detective later turned out to show up, <laughs> it was actually Mark Furman. The same guy that claimed that he vaguely remembers going to this house. Now, who in, who in their right mind is going to believe that you vaguely remember going to arguably the most famous uh, uh, black uh, American at that time in sports in sports and in, in, and in movies? All right. You're going to yeah. forget that you went to his mansion in Brentwood and it was his his white wife who on tape we heard later, Mark Furman, in the audio tapes when he was doing this uh the playbook with that writer in North Carolina say that he would go out of his way anytime that he saw a black man with a white woman to find a reason to fucking arrest him. This is a guy that's claiming he didn't remember. He vaguely remembered going there and showing up that day and, and, and the whole incident, which is ridiculous. Well, who, who the fuck believes that? I have a question though. Um, back to those journals, if it came out in the civil case, that yes. the sister no, no, wrote criminal, them. criminal. It came out in the oh, oh, the the diary entry. You mean? Yeah. If it came yeah. out that she, the sister wrote them, then how did they win the civil case? Because I know they won the civil case. Of course, they yeah, won the civil so case. Look at look at the jurors that were on the case, and 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 they didn't they didn't allow almost eighty percent of the stuff that was used in the criminal trial. They didn't use in there, and you have to remember something. It's it's the same reason why a lot of the times. Uh, and I'll use this as an example, just because we're in, we're in this genre, so to speak. You know, uh, the feds go and they arrest um, John Gotti Jr. Right. So when John Gotti Jr. gets a hung jury and acquittal in his first trial, the feds don't mind because all the mistakes that they made during that trial, when they do their when they do the second one, when they reindict him, they they're not going to make the same mistakes that they made in the first trial. So all those little mistakes that the prosecution made and the errors that they made in the criminal trial. The civil trial, they didn't do that because they know where they fucked up. Right, but in your example, you're going criminal case to criminal case. This is criminal case to civil case. No, my no, my point is is that the the evidence that was presented that they used in the civil trial, a lot of it was used in the criminal trial to get his acquittal. Therefore, the prosecutors in the civil trial or the the attorneys knew what stuff not to introduce and what stuff to stay away from that would make their case look weak. So they, okay, it wasn't so in as, there. Long as, as long as it's not introduced, it can't be used against them. Yeah, and, and you also have to remember, too, that the threshold in a criminal trial, which is beyond all reasonable doubt, in a civil in a civil trial, civil litigation, it's only by a preponderance of the evidence. Right, right. So it's two totally different things. It's, 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 comparing, it's comparing apples and oranges at that point. Now, did they use a jury in the civil case? Of course. Okay. Well, I don't know. I don't. I'm. I'm not a law student. <laughs> well, yeah. No, of course it was a civil trial. Yeah, they have a, they have a jury. Yeah, absolutely. And one of the main jurors that was on there said that she thought O.J. Simpson was guilty from the from the criminal trial, and I'm sure a bunch of the people that were on the jury thought the same way. So that's that was their payback, basically. Is the you know what I mean? What is what is monet what is the monetary outcome going to be of a civil trial in regards to criminals? Just two totally different things true michael uh what kind of cigar is that a padron who is that it's michael hensley oh michael how you doing brother oh, i think shit. he's muted we can't I, I can't hear him let me see if he's muted sure 
fuck that. No, he's not muted. We can't hear you, bro. Does he have earbuds on? <laughs> I can't see. I, I'm not sure. He'll figure it out, I'm sure. On I'm the stream yard, click button. on the settings and make sure you have the right microphone uh, um, set, uh, connected. Who, me? No, him. Oh, yeah, because lately I haven't had the right microphone. Yeah, right. There, 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 you go. Oh, yeah. there, you there we go. How are you? Yeah. Right? This is uh, good to see you too, brother. It's the devil's hand. Esteban Carreras. Oh, nice. Yeah. Good shit. So what's your opinion on this OJ thing? Man, it was a long time ago. I was in Marine Corps boot camp when, you know, this happened. So I, I'm going to be honest with you. I don't, I don't know a whole lot about it. But, I mean, I know, I know about as much as everybody else does, I guess. Do I think he did Fair it? Enough. Most likely, yeah. You think he did it? Well, you know. The mob didn't do it. A lot of people do. That's for goddamn sure. Yeah. Hold yeah. on. Uh, Frank Gerard for Tello Productions. What's up, bro? Good to see you, How you, you doing, man. guys? What's going on, everybody? Yeah. How's it going, Frank? Uh, yeah. Uh, good, how are chilling. you? Chilling. Yeah, good to see you, everybody. Uh, come. Nice to meet you. Uh, you too, bro. Yeah. I, how do you explain it? This is a big... You'd have a field day with... Um, OJ Chris, you know, the hypocrisy. He never wanted to be, you know, considered black. You know that, right? He wanted, you know, his friend Rod Ship said that he never did anything, you know, for the black community or anything. And he, he said to his friend Rod Ship that I don't want to be black, I'm only white. I want to be considered OJ. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, and, yeah, yeah. And, and so right. it's, a, it's a joke how they stood behind him with all that stuff. And then you know, Common, yeah. that in the, when, they, when the jurors went to the house to visit his house, you know they they changed all the pictures in the house. You know that he had all white. Yeah, all, yeah all, they his staged, wife, they, all his white. They staged the whole house, and he put them. They put all black pictures up there. It's, Did it's, they really? Yeah, they changed the yes, pictures in the house. Yes, yes, holy that's, shit, that's a true fact. Yes, yes. But my question, common. Sure. Look, look at all the DNA. How do you explain all the DNA? DNA don't lie. Okay, sure. Okay, sure. Explain what, what, to what, me what, the DNA. Explain it to me. Go ahead. All right. Well, this is going to take a little while, but but sure. Uh, in particular, which which part of the DNA are you referring to? The stuff at OJ's house, the stuff in the Bronco, well, or the stuff Well, first of all, at, the, at the, the, the cut the cut on his hand. Okay. Yeah. He said that the blood drifted on the left side on the pavement, which considers a cut on the left hand. That was his blood. Okay. Now I do want to know why there wasn't more blood than there was, because that that place was full of blood. There wasn't you, you know a you lot. Know, you know. you know that there was you know that there was less than one tenth of one drop of blood in that entire Bronco. Yeah, and you know what that one tenth of blood was in that Bronco? Guess whose blood it was? It was Ron. It was it was right. It, it was the coal, so, and it was okay, OJ. So, whether it was one percent, no, 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 no. There was no. It wasn't OJ's. It was Nicole and Ron's. There was no OJ blood in that car. All right. So let's, how did that? Let's, get let's clarify that. So, so you have you have you have to remember who's the person who's the person that found the so-called blood on on and in the car. If you're saying Furman did, I I, I don't listen. Yes, it's Furman, Mark Furman. Furman, listen, Furman, Furman might have yes. been racist, okay? But he he, he did he didn't plant the glove. Yeah. He, he did not you plant that glove there. You have, you have to let me answer if you're going to yeah, ask okay, me go something, ahead, go brother. Yeah. All right. So, like I said, you, you have to go back to you have to go back to uh, how the blood was discovered. How who who discovered this this alleged blood in the glove? And then you have to go back to the actual DNA evidence itself that got the results from the forensic lab, okay? Okay. When they when they went and they got the results of the blood, let's say on OJ's sock in his in his master bedroom, right? You remember that the yes. bloody sock allegedly. Yeah. Okay. Well, what happened? What happened when they actually went and they looked at that sock? Do you know that that sock was sent to three different labs and looked at three different times and no blood was ever seen on it until two or three months later? Well, I did I you, know. Did you well, did you know that the, the that if there's a foot inside of a sock, right? And everybody knows human blood, when, when it hits air, it dries pretty quickly within a matter of minutes. So they claim that uh, OJ committed these grisly murders with all this blood. I mean, it looked like it looked like a river of blood flowing down the sidewalk. I mean, these people were brutally murdered. All right. Yeah. He had one one drop of blood, a perfectly round. It wasn't a splatter, which it would have had to been if it was blood that came from either one of these victims. It was a perfectly round drop of blood that transferred from the outside of the sock on the right side all the way to the inside to the inside part of the sock on the left side and the outside of the left sock which is impossible if there's a foot inside that sock when that blood gets on that sock all right 
Now, when they did the examinations of this, what did they find out when they did the DNA on it? They did the PCR testing and they did the regular DNA testing that they had at that time. And you know what they found in the in the in the DNA on on that on Nicole's blood on that sock? They found EDTA in it. EDTA, and, and, yeah. EDTA for people don't know is the anticoagulant that's used in, in tubes when you when you get your blood drawn or your blood taken, so it doesn't harden instantly, which blood does once it gets in contact with it. Okay, air. do you know when you wash something in a wash machine, the soap nope. detergent uh, causes EDTA? Uh, no. This is what they tried to do during the criminal trial, and, and they took sample fibers and other pieces of that sock and did the same testing, and there was no EDTA in it. When they did the sample drops of blood that were on that were on the glove, there was no EDTA in it. When they did the ones that were at Nicole's house, no EDTA in it. But they did find EDTA in the sock, and they found EDTA in the blood drops that were on the back gate, which wasn't discovered until a month later. Now the two huge problems that the that the prosecutors and the and the LAPD had the forensic team was trying to explain how and when the video when the videographer did did the step by step process before the blood collection at OJ's house when the videographer walks up the stairs into OJ's bedroom and pans around the whole entire bedroom they claim that this sock this bloody sock was laying in the middle of his floor on the carpet in front of his bed the videographer that videotaped the entire house before the crime scene, people came in with forensics, the sock wasn't there. So how come it wasn't on the video? And did you know for four or five months they tried to claim that they had no information and no video on it? They tried hiding it for months. Let me the ask you, gate, comment. The back, the back oh, gate ahead, was ahead. photo, the back gate on the day after the or day of or day after the murders, however you want to look at it was photographed by the forensics, by the LAPD. There was no blood drops anywhere on that back gate. All of a sudden, almost an entire month later, they go back to the crime scene after it had already been hosed down, rinsed down, exposed to all the elements goes, and they find what they claim was a, a blood spot on the back gate and, and away from it. And when they, when, when they tested that DNA, once again, they found EDTA in it. That wasn't on a that wasn't on a fabric. There was no clothing to be washed down there. And this was a blood drop they claimed that was exposed to the elements for over a month. Now the bigger problem that the LAPD had and the forensics uh, uh, lab had is explaining how the concentration of blood, meaning the actual sample itself, the concentration and purity of that blood. So say you cut your finger right now and you dropped a, a, a blood drop right on the ground and it was collected right now and they sent it out to a lab to get tested. They would be able to tell how 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 pure how clean that that sample was you know saying that it's basically fresh and as stuff is left out in the elements whether it's the sun whether it's heat whether it's light dna degrades over a period of time and as a matter of fact if the temperatures exceed 80 85 90 degrees that dna can be gone within a matter of hours un undetectable untraceable at this time today we have a lot different and a lot better methods of collection and ability to process stuff, but that back then they didn't have this. You gotta remember this was over 30 years ago. DNA was still brand new at that time. Well, what was your question? Sorry, I just wanted to clear that up. No, I was gonna ask you real quick, uh, and, and of course we'll, we'll get back to the actual case, but who do you sure. think did it if not OJ? You think it was the kids? Wh whose kids? No, I don't, I, I don't know who OJ. did it, honestly, I don't know. I'm, no, no, I don't think his kids did it, no, that's crazy. They were trying to say for a long time that the son Jason or whatever might have had something to do with it. There was this whacked out uh, private detective named uh, Bill Deere from Texas, who's a who's a fucking crackpot that wound up. I was watching him earlier on network TV on like, yeah, he's a moron. That guy's an idiot. I mean, that's all bullshit. He didn't do it. I knew the hat, case. the hat that they found at the scene. There's a picture with Jason Simpson with that particular hat on his head. But all that means is he borrowed his son's hat to kill him. You know what I mean? They killed him. You know what I mean? They found that. Well, I mean, it, it was a standard. It was a standard winter hat. Then, yeah. Then, you know, it's not like he had on a fucking Gucci hat or Louis. How do you explain the black like, the black hair fibers in the hat? Who, who, whose hair? Whose hat was that? How do you explain that? They they don't know. They weren't able to test it or uh, or match it to anyone. They said in in the trial the exact words that they used is that oh the hair is possibly consistent with somebody that's African American. Well. You can take the hair from any African American, or probably even somebody with a Spanish background, like Dominican per se, or or, or some parts of you know the Middle East that have the same type of hair. So, I mean, I I, I can't say for sh for sure, and I don't think that that's by any means. And also, uh, let's let's take a look at, look at the crime scene itself. You know how small that area was where that crime took place. How small that was. Yeah, I know. So, how, how many people could have been in there doing all that without nobody heard anything? No, they did. There were witnesses that heard that heard it. 
So some of them testified in trial. Some of them weren't called. Two of the witnesses that they were going to call that OJ's defense team wound up not calling. You have to remember that um, OJ was actually going to take the stand in that case. He wanted to take the witness stand. They were preparing him to go up there. But what happened is a lot of people will remember is that they were down to uh, 12 of their main jurors and only one or two alternates. If, the, if they lost one more juror, then they were going to get an automatic mistrial, which is what the prosecutors at that point were trying to do. OJ's defense team wound up uh, uh, settling their case and not and, and going to closing arguments because if they lost one more juror, they were going to get a, a, a mistrial. So a lot of the information and stuff that they were going to put on, they wound up not putting on because they were confident in their defense at that point that they didn't need to produce any of these other people because that, it would have just hurt them in the long run. And they felt that they didn't need it. And, you know, they were right. They got, you know, he got acquitted. So, and listen, I'm not going to sit here and say that anybody that thinks that OJ Simpson is, is innocent or, uh, or is guilty or whatever is wrong. I, I'm not saying that everybody has the right to that and the opinion to that. But I think the problem is, is that if, if people knew the scope and the gravity and the actual evidence itself, not just what the surface level is of the general knowledge people have. If you actually looked at the evidence, then you, you would come to the same conclusion where you could say that I, I'm not 100% certain that this guy committed this murder. It doesn't make any sense. How, how is it? How, I have to ask people, too. You know, you brought up the blood, right? That was at uh, OJ's. Uh, let's, let's say started from the Bronco. You, are, you familiar, are you familiar where the blood was found uh, at his home? Yeah, it was found first on the door at first, right? The door. They, oh, the saw first, they first, the they first, they first saw the spot on the door when they looked at the car. Yeah, that's what firm. That's what Furman claimed. But the problem is, is that do you know that they never tested that drop on the door? That I don't. Why know. not? Yeah, they didn't. No, they, I'm telling you, they didn't. That blood that was never that was never determined to be blood. It was never determined to be Nicole's, OJ's, or Ron Goldman's. It was never even tested. And there was no results from it. And then when it, when it got lighter out, they saw the drops leading up the stairwells and into the house, though. They, they, yes, they, yeah. there was five. There were five or six drops of blood in the driveway, and one small uh, blood drop in the front foyer. So you have to ask yourself. Let's go back to what the prosecution claim occurred that night, right? They claimed that, and you saw the you saw the homicide scenes. You saw the the blood yeah, yeah, and, and was, the gravity was, of the murders, brutal. right? Yeah, yeah. Do you do you think that anybody that was there that killed those two people with that amount of blood would be able to leave? five drops of blood or less than one or one tenth drop of blood in their entire vehicle. Well, you also got the theory that he, that there was somebody with him that he gave the clothes to. Well, that, but this, this is, this is a lot of stuff. There's no proof for any of this stuff. No, I know. I mean, it's, it's all, it's all conjecture and theory. I, the and one thing not... I do know is how there wasn't a lot more blood. That is crazy that there wasn't uh -huh. a lot more, but the bottom line is there was blood. And it was his blood. right, but that but it goes <laughs> no. back. It goes it goes back to the problem with the, with the people that collected the blood. And the problem is, is that they got caught framing who the LAPD thought was a guilty person. Now here's the issue: yeah. where the Bronco was parked out in front of the house on, on on the street there, right by the curb, correct? They claimed, all right, this is the prosecution and the LAPD. They claimed that OJ went from his Bronco through his neighbor's yard, around the back area where his tennis courts were and ran down the backside of the bungalows where his daughter and Cato Kalen's places were, up the front of his house, and then into his front foyer, which the limo driver, if you'll remember, Alan Park claimed yeah. that he saw somebody shortly before OJ came out, appeared to be walking into the house. Well, what and happened was he, when he first got there, he didn't see nobody there. The truck wasn't there, the Bronco. Then when he came back 20 minutes later, the Bronco was parked, and he saw OJ running into the house. Well, that's... Okay, so that that's what he claimed. But if you this is the thing, you have to listen to the testimony that these guys gave in trial. When the defense team was questioning Alan Park on what he said that day, he he never said he was positive that there wasn't a Bronco there. He said that he had gotten there early. He had never been there before because the per, OJ's OJ's regular limo driver, I, the guy's name was Dale something. I can't remember off the top of my head. That might be wrong, but I think it was Dale something that usually picked him up and gave him that's all why his he rides. Got was, there early because he wasn't familiar. Yeah, yes, does. exactly. Yeah. So the way that he claimed that he went in there and he drove down the street, the way that he was explaining it, he never said like, oh, um, uh, I forget the, the angle or the direction, whichever way that he came in. He said he doesn't remember if the car was there or wasn't there when he had driven by. He just noticed it after that he had already parked. Well, the problem is, is that on that street in Brentwood, this was this was a, a very affluent, wealthy neighborhood. He, he never also at one time, nor were there any witnesses that said at any point that they saw or heard any car uh, driving up and down that street, parked the door shut, none of the above. So uh, 
if if people do know the, the worst form of of testimony in any court of law is eyewitness testimony. A hundred people can all witness a murder and have a hundred different explanations for what they saw. That is true. If you if you understand what I'm saying here, Tom, you so, should have been you should have been on the dream team with these guys. Jesus, it should have been yeah. on the dream he team. Said, you thought? Would you believe? <laughs> That's funny. So <laughs> common so, sense just, leaves people speechless. They yeah, don't even know what to say. Yeah, but common was in team. diapers when this was going yeah, on. Yeah. So. No, no, well, I was, I, I know, was, this I was 11, investigation I was 11 or 12, was tainted I was 11 because these people old. thought they had a slam dunk, and they didn't. Yeah. Common so, so sense knows the part, his stuff. He can talk. You the, talk me out of my opinion. The the part <laughs> the, the part the part that I wanted to explain about these blood drops though is to go back to what the prosecutors and the LA claims happened that night, right? So like I said, they claim that he parked his Bronco in the street, right? Walked behind the Bronco through his neighbor's yard or around the back of the property where they, they, they had tennis courts that had joined each other in the back. How about, the way, he, how about the way he parked it? That's somebody well, in a rush trying to get back in the house that he just did something wrong, the way that was parked. Uh, we, we could talk about that in one second. <laughs> so he, he, he walks, they claim, through the tennis courts and walks behind the bungalows where his daughter and Kayla lived around the garage and into the front of the home. Well, I don't know about you, but if, if if you're bleeding from your hand, why is there no drops of blood going from the Bronco through the neighbor's yard, behind his property, behind any parts of the bungalows behind the house where the glove was found, anywhere in the front of the house or anywhere after that front door entrance of his home? He had white he had white carpets that went up and down his staircase from his front door that led upstairs to his master bedroom. They didn't find a single drop of blood trace or anything on any piece of white carpet in that entire home. And you have to ask yourself, if this guy was so good that he that he prepared, you have to remember, too, that you have to be under the assumption that OJ premeditated this murder. He didn't do it on a whim. OK, you have to be under that assumption. So if you're under that assumption, how is it that he was so good that he got rid of all of all of the clothes that he wore that night, got rid of the murder weapon? Got, got rid of the shoes and everything else, but he dropped the glove randomly behind the bungalows and forgot the sock in the middle of his bed in the middle of his bedroom. You have to I, believe all these things. I still think he, even if he didn't physically do it, he had something well, to do with it. it. Uh, but now well, we're changing well, the entire well, scope of the argument here, though. That's a whole different thing of whether OJ did it. So he might have known about it. That's not the. Uh. I, I've been. Well, I think she's saying he might have taken part on in it. On the way to oh, the, like he was there. The you mean? To the first day. Yeah, kid. yeah. He he well, could have been there sure. and not done anything. Um, but I I I will forever think he had something to do with it. That, that yeah, and I, I, I listen. Mean, everybody's entitled to their opinion. As to him doing the physical, oh. as to him doing the physical act, uh, um, you make some very good points that he didn't. Um, but I will well, forever I'll, think that he had something to do with it. Okay, so I'll have to I'll have to ask you I'll have to ask somebody this in in, in response to that, right? Um, would you agree that um, O.J. Simpson is a very uh, committed family man, loves his children, has got a very close knit family? I don't know him personally. I I would never agree yeah. to that. We, yeah, but I, I would okay. disagree I to it. Hey. I wouldn't well, disagree to it either. I just I just okay. don't know. Him. Well, the, well, I'll I'll bring this up, and it was testified to by by everybody in the trial. People that known him for years, people that liked him, people that didn't like him. Even Nicole Brown Simpson's family themselves um, said this about him and his love for his children. You have to assume now. Let's say hypothetically, we'll just throw this in there for your argument that um O.J. Simpson was at at this. He didn't commit the murders, but he was there, right? Uh, some type of argument broke out. He was with somebody else, and something went wrong, and these people got murdered, right? So. You have to remember that both of OJ's young children at this time were, were inside of that home. Yes. The door was the door was left wide open and the yes. dog was got the reason that they got to the crime scene was because the dog was running around the neighborhood barking Morgan. getting somebody's attention. Yep, yep. So you'd have to assume as a father that you just went and brutally murdered your children's mother and left the door wide open so that your children had the possibility of walking down and seeing their mother laid down there in a pool of, of that bloody I don't, I don't think, and had I don't no think. qualms. And had no qualms about doing so. Well, if it broke out, um, if it wasn't premeditated and it just broke yeah, out, like, in an angry breach. Okay, you're so, not so, thinking of that. So this, but this is, but 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 you, but like but, I said, how how can you do that when he was so prepared to get rid of all of the murder clothes, the murder weapon, and all of this stuff? He was so careful that he got less than one tenth of one so drop bloody. of blood in this entire see. Bronco. How yeah. could you do that? Yeah, it's it was impossible. so bloody. I don't see how. Yeah, it's impossible. 
But how, do you, how, how do you explain there was no Multiple other cars? That doesn't mean he got back in, that the people that did it got back into the same car with him and went in the same direction. So he, he drove home naked because you're, you said he did this on a whim. So he was driving around the car naked after he just no, butchered no, no, two no, people. No. I said he was there. I'm saying he was there. But they, the they people... found no evidence of anybody else in that courtyard. There was so uh, there was no footprints. The only footprints there was his. No, so no, no. You're assuming. No, you can't say that they were his. They were not. But they, his. What, they were hazmat suits and killed these people. Uh, how did they, they didn't leave? Nothing. They left. No the, killer, the, the killers left. Not one set of footprints, but two sets of footprints. All right. You had, I see. This is this is the part that I'm, I, I struggle with is because I, I I'm I'm having a conversation, but and it's no slight to you guys, and I'm not saying you guys should have should know all this stuff about this case. I don't. I don't I'm not under that assumption, but. The stuff that you're bringing up is stuff that if you watch the trial and you listen to testimony and what they said, you would know that that's not true. You understand? Maybe. Well, they, 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 they claim that Maybe Jesus carried him. <laughs> yeah, he got yeah, carried out. I, he floated out of there. And I do have to say, regardless of whether OJ was there or not, um, the amount of footprints that was there would be funky anyway. So, you know, if there was only OJ's footprints there, um, you know, so if it was so only during, him, so, dur so if, during if the trial, they produced. OJ, if it wasn't OJ, all right, and then common, you said the other night, you did make a good point about the footprints and the pavers. Yeah. Um, so if there's only one footprint there, so regardless of whether it was OJ or not, there's only going to be one footprint there. You see what I'm saying? Whether he did it or not. So. I, you know, the amount of footprints makes a difference as far as how many people were there. But regardless of who was there, the footprints would have been the same amount. Yeah. So, so, so during, during the trial and F. Lee Bailey brought this up after, um, uh, their lead, um, investigator, uh, Dr. Henry Lee, uh, was overlooking crime scene, uh, photos and evidence, right? And they had produced a picture of what the what later became the infamous Bruno Mali shoe sole, right? That they claimed uh, OJ wore that night to carry out these murders, which never appeared during the criminal trial, but later during the civil trial were later produced by. And I don't even want to get into it because these guys were s s just ridiculous. The whole thing was stupid. Um, but the problem is, is that you have to remember that in 1994, there weren't computers and Internet access like there is today. And, and what I'm getting at is that, it, you know, even, even though, you know, quote unquote, shoe prints or shoe print experts came in to testify that, oh, this shoe came directly from a Bruno Mali shoe and it was a size 12 and there was only X amount of pairs sold. And uh, they came from this factory in Italy and they actually went out to Italy and flew out there and looked at the, the um, factory and looked at shoe samples and they did all kinds of crazy shit like that. But the bottom line is, is that later on it's been determined now and the fbi had to admit to this that much like tire prints shoe prints are not reliable at all and the database that they had for shoe prints at that time the cat will catalog will so to speak wasn't wasn't at the ability of stuff that we have today where we can literally search for something and let's say today that you have a shoe print uh from a um from a from a i don't know um an off-brand shoe company or, or, or whatever and we'll find out that in that factory in China, not only does that shoe print sole go to the to the Air Jordan, but it also goes to the to the knockoff Air Jordan, and it goes to a Puma. Puma used it on a different shoe, and Gucci used it on one of their shoes. And there's a whole breakdown on on what possible companies use that exact shoe sole. Well, what they later determined is after the civil trial and all of this commenced is that th that wasn't just a sole from a Bruno Mali shoe. In fact, it was the same sole that was carried out by 20 other shoe companies, but they weren't named brands at that time. And they didn't have catalogs and internet access like they do now to go out and find out that these other shoes existed that used that same sole. But one of the primary soles that they later found out that was used on that Bruno Mali uh, dress boot was a company called Lord, L-O-R-D, Lord. And they're a boot company. They make construction boots. And at that time, Lord used that same exact sole on their work boots. But this is stuff that people don't know. So when you sit here and you say, oh, OJ killed him in the Bruno Mali shoes, which they never found, by the way. All they had was this one picture from a, a football game one day. No, they came out with a lot more pictures than that. They had a lot more. They were all from the same day. They were all from the same day, from the same game. 
And the two kid, the two kids that produced these photos, they later determined. Um, I forget who it was. It was during the civil trial, and they determined that two of them they believed to, to had been photoshopped, and the the main one they say that it was possible that he had worn those. But this was several years. This was several years prior to that uh, to the murders that occurred, and this was all the way across the country in New York. And everybody knows that uh, OJ routinely, and it came up during the trial, they admitted it during the criminal trial, that every off season when OJ would leave Buffalo when he was doing the announcements and the home games, he would go back to LA and he would live there for the rest of the eight months out of the rest of the year. But he would donate and give his clothes away to everybody when he was out there. They never found any single one of the suits he was wearing, the ties he was wearing, the jackets he was wearing in his home in LA or his uh, residence out in New York. Well, let so, me just say, I mean, that's wouldn't it be a hell of a coin- yeah, wouldn't it be a hell of a coincidence, though, that he owned a pair of shoes that have the same uh, sole as as the one that made the footprints at the murder scene? No, but what I'm saying is they didn't prove that. It was just their theory, though. It was never proven. You understand? It was never proven that that was the exact shoe. It was theory. I mean, I could. That's like that's like me finding a, a footprint that you made somewhere, and then I find out that 20 years earlier you might have worn a shoe that was like that or had that similar footprint. But but as I was saying on the show yesterday, if you remember that they claim and they know for a fact because they got all all of OJ shoes at his house, they were all size 12 to size 13, which is the size that they claim uh, was the shoe of the, of, of the of the murderer. But the problem is when you looked at the picture. From the evidence from the murder and you look they measured the tiles the pavers that were in that walkway outside of her house they were all 10 and a half inch pavers you cannot fit a size 12 shoe inside one of those pavers and the picture in the photograph of the one clear footprint that they have fit heel to toe inside of that paver it's a famous picture anybody fps you want to pull it up you can pull it up yeah well uh, w- which one the the picture of the if paver you look itself? up the just uh, type in uh bruno molly footprint uh, murder Nicole or something like that. It should uh, let me let me see. Yeah. Why did he lie about the fucking shoes though? Yeah, he didn't lie about the shoes. They asked him if he ever owned Bruno Molly shoes, and he says, "I don't know, maybe." No, they he said he would never, them. absolutely never wear those ugly, ugly shoes. And he's and he was he probably thought he was right and said, "I would never wear those ugly shoes." When you're when you, when you work when you work in TV and you work and you work for the for these companies and stuff, People a lot of the times they give you, you don't necessarily pick out. Yeah, they, they they give you stuff to wear and say, "Hey, put these shoes on, put this jacket on, put this coat on. Here's your stuff." How and, about and the, pro- the problem? The problem the pro- the problem is during the civil trial that we'll go back to these shoes when they determine that some of the photos were photoshopped. They proved it in the civil trial. Those shoes that they claimed that OJ was wearing were suede shoes. Now you tell me what person would wear suede shoes in the middle of a rainstorm. Why come you what are you, you talking about the down. night of the murders? No, the shoes that they allegedly got OJ wearing from the Buffalo Bills game. That day was torrential right. downpour and they had like 40 mile an hour winds and it was pouring rain out. And they got him walking out in a pair of suede shoes. You want to wear suede fucking shoes in the middle of a rainstorm? Why come you didn't take the lie detector test? You know what he said? I don't want to take it because I've had dreams of killing her. Well, oh, is that true? He did take a true. Don't make you guilty. He didn't take the lie detector test. He took one before he was arrested. He he didn't he took take one before it. lie yeah. detector test before he got arrested. And he said to his friend that I've had Robert. dreams of killing her. I mean, let's let's be fair here. Unless we're talking about sneakers, most men don't know the name brand of their shoes. I know, know George. I know Nike. And wrong shot. That, that, that guy wasn't George. Oh, wrong, uh, was, panel. Yes, if it was George. Huh? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Fuck it. Right. Common would know his too. But but well, yeah. common. Yeah, but that's what I'm saying. When, when they asked him, when they asked him. Yeah, but when they asked him about his shoes, he says, I don't ever know know or remember a name brand pair of shoes that I own unless they're like Nike or Adidas because he was sponsored by some of them and they would give him shoes. Yeah, he's an athlete. You know what I mean? I think most of his shoes were actually, um, I forget what company they were for. He was sponsored by, uh, I don't know if it was Reebok or one of them companies, but he had like 60, 70 pairs in his closet at his house. Some, right. some shit like that. Don't you feel, I mean, it, common, it does seem like you're really giving him the benefit of the doubt because, I mean... There's, a, you there's also to. a very good chance that he right. did remember that he had those shoes. How can you not? Say that again. 
Say that again. I mean, there's also a very good chance that he's just lying and he absolutely did know he had those well, shoes and he was just lying about, it. you know what I mean? And, and like the, as far as, well, um, you know, the night it, it happened, it's like they should have proved it, but they didn't prove it though. That's the problem. They, ne they right. never found, they never found the empty box of shoes when he had 200 something pairs in his closet and every shoe was in the box that he ever owned. So what did he do? He murdered them in these shoes and also was smart enough to get rid of the box. Yeah. The, the stuff no, but you have to, you, why, you can't take. Why uh, would he? Why would he necessarily have the box though? Because he had the I boxes for all the other shoes. I got the box of all my shoes. Well, maybe that's why too. he chose those. Maybe They're that's why right he here. chose those. He didn't have the box. He fucking hated oh, yeah. them. They were ugly, and he figured, "Fuck it, I'll get rid of them as soon as I kill these people." Or he did pre-plan <laughs> it and got rid of the box first. That's well, crazy. He was found not guilty, so we should be having the conversation on, you know, how we're proving indifferent. Well, that that's kind of that's kind of what I was saying before. Is like, you know, if, if somebody has an opinion or they believe that he was guilty, I'm fine with that. I think everybody has a right to do that. But right. if if we're talking about, uh, you know, somebody's life here and them absolutely knowing you committed murder without having actual proof of it, you know, that's like what people do on here and claim that you can't, you know, convict people without proof, you know. This is so, all just based on opinion. So common. Right there. So what was ever said about uh, Ron Goldman's enemy, en enemies? Pardon my French. I, I don't I don't believe that he had any. Well I think they I think they looked into him, but I think he was pretty squeaky clean for the most part. I know he was involved in um some drug dealing uh, at the lower level like cocaine and stuff in the mezzanine the restaurant he worked in, but I don't think anything became of it in regards to any enemies he had, but I, I believe that they did look into him. I, well, obviously they did it was a murder investigation, you know. Makes you wonder, um, right? Yeah, because that was that was something that OJ's defense team looked into thoroughly with their private investigators. Oh, you imagine. know, they they keep they keep focusing on the fact that oh these people were there to kill Nicole, but is it possible that these people yes. were following Goldman and killed him, and it just happened to be wrong place, she wrong got time? In the way. Shit like that happens all the time. Hey, you know? cocaine that'll do it. Why'd he run? Why'd who run? OJ. He's what black. do you mean he well, hold on? What do you mean he ran? He black and he killed a white woman. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a good reason. That's I love but, you, but brother. If, God if, if you're talking if you're if you're talking about what, what the police what the police tried to claim is that he ran well, he was at the cemetery visiting uh, Nicole's grave without Collins that day. And when it was and when it was discovered, he was supposed to turn himself in that day. He had worked out a deal with Bob Shapiro. You have to remember something. O.J. Simpson was probably one of the most beloved people in the entire country. He was the first black athlete to cross over into mainstream America and do Hertz commercials. The first black person ever. He wasn't even looked at as as a black person. You have somebody that's been put on this pedestal of of being somewhat of like a right. god in human form, so to speak, and his wife gets murdered, and overnight they're saying that this guy is a fucking vicious murderer, and the person that he's been his entire life was just thrown out the window. What did you fucking freak out? One of the few. Black I don't know. I, I mean, no. If I'm, in, I don't think I would. I don't think I'd go on a slow speed chase for. You know, however long. The, but it the, wasn't the, a slow the, speed chase. They followed him from the cemetery to his house. They Al Cowlings called when Al Cowlings was on the freeway. He called nine one one and said, "We're on our way to OJ's house. He's going to see his mother." And who the fuck? What a slow speed chase? That's a that's an oxymoron. That's say you're stupid smart. You know what I mean? No, not necessarily. A slow speed chase. There's no such thing. They, yeah, they were it, following. No, him, it, sure. it means you're driving slow, but you're not stopping. Why did yeah, he just stop and say, here I am, I'm fucking innocent? Because he said, I'm on my way to my house right now to go see my mother. And the guy was freaking yeah. the fuck out. He was accused of killing his ex-wife and two people. And everybody in the public, including the news, is saying that he's fucking guilty. He's feeling like my life's over right now. I can't yeah, why, say, you why can't say what that? somebody else would think or, or feel to freak out. If somebody freaks out, they freak out. I'm not them. And I don't know what I would I don't do. Want to they be kept that out of the race, race, but uh, the LAPD yeah. didn't exactly but have again, a track record, track record with you know African Americans at that. Yeah, time. yeah, but come on, uh, this is again giving him the benefit of the doubt. And this was right after Rodney, and then the only this reason right after Rodney, bang. Bang. yeah, and the only reason fucking uh, that they didn't stop him sooner is because he's OJ. They let him drive uh, at bang. whatever fucking pace to back to his house or whatever. Uh, but but listen, if I'm if I'm being followed by the cops and I'm innocent. I'm just gonna stop. What are you yeah. gonna do to me? You're gonna yeah, arrest me for but, what? But you're a regular. 
you're a regular person. This is O.J. Simpson, one of the most famous people in the fucking world, man. He, he's, he's not afforded the regular rights of regular citizens. He didn't live the same life as any of us. He's been privileged. No, he's in, he's life. afforded way he's afforded way more rights than regular uh, citizens. Yes and no. That's yes and no. But what I'm saying is, you 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 trying to put yourself in his shoes and think what he thinks and how he acts. You can't do that because. You've never been in his position to understand what that's like. No, I know this. So I, I know I that anybody with call on what I, I'll tell you what I know. I know that anybody with fucking brains is going to say, "Okay, if I don't stop right now and I keep going, it's going to look more and more like I'm fucking guilty." So why not just pull over? You know what I mean? Well, and, and start working I, on proving I, I the fact okay, that so I'm Jay doing. Simpson has experienced so, so if, more so racism, they, they tried, racism they tried, in Hollywood than most. Sure, you, yeah, and, but and, and, but he's also got the the world's cameras on him. The police are not going to pull OJ out of the car and beat his that's ass. That's when most the of whole us fucking fail. World was but unfortunately, that's when most of us fail. And 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 what and what you're saying is right now is that you're you know and, and this is a this is a basic rule that can be used against you, which is um, a flight could be used in court as an admission of guilt. But here's the problem: they never use that quote-unquote chase in, in in the criminal court yeah why never wasn't, that in, why it wasn't any, it in the trial they kept it out why be, because because they know that that's not what it was they know that he called 911 and said i'm on my way to my mother's house when the phone uh, died i'll explain this hold on one second didn't he have didn't didn't al cowling say that he had a fucking gun to his head in a car in the yeah, uh, the bronco yeah, oj so. yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. i gotta talk him out of killed himself yeah, so what are you going to fucking kill yourself for? Yeah, You're innocent, yeah. right? What about that letter he wrote? That, that, I just that told you. you read. I just told you. The guy's, the guy's been looked at as, as, as an icon for his entire life. And overnight, the person who he is and the person that everybody looked at, when, when, when Nicole died, he, he felt like he died that night. And these people are saying that I did this shit without even getting a fair shake in, in a trial or for him to say anything. He was, and he was facing being arrested and going to jail for the rest of his life for something that he says he didn't commit. And you well, or okay. he, or he knew that he killed these him. people and he was going to prison for life. It could also be that. It could well, be. If, but but here's the thing. If I, if my aunt had a dick, she'd be my uncle. Woulda, coulda, shoulda. That don't mean nothing. You can't you can't say something and then say if right after it. Why not? I'm, I'm giving an alternate reason for why he might not have or for why he didn't stop. And, and, he, had, and he had a gun to his head. I could offer an alternative. No, and that's and that's why I'm saying I'm offering you his side of the story, which is this is why he said this is what he did. So then it just comes down to a personal opinion at that point, whether or not you think yeah. that, oh no, he did this because of this, or oh, okay, I believe when he did it because of that. But they didn't use it. But your side would trial. be opinion too, because you're saying you think he did it for one reason. I'm saying I think he did it for another. Yeah, so it's based on opinion. That's an opinion. It's not a yeah, fact. Okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah, as long as it's not being presented as fact, either side, then everything's fine. Yeah, that's why I'm saying that's not a fact. So you can't use that and just say, oh, he's guilty because it's not a fact. It's just an opinion that you think that the way the guy reacted means he's guilty. And then the other No, no, no. Fact, but my opinion is no no uh, less valid than yours because it's just both of us are just giving our opinion on why he didn't stop. You know what I mean? Right. And and the but the point is is that you're trying to you're trying to vindicate it by saying that only a guilty person would act like this. And what I'm explaining to you is that in a court of law, people can use flight as an admission of guilt. So then my question is, how come the prosecutors never use that during the criminal trial if they thought that that's what he was doing? Because the whole fucking world, including the jury, already knew that he ran. I mean, what are they going to what are they going to beat a fucking dead horse? Oh, by the way, OJ didn't stop. I well, mean, what also, good would it have done, knew, really? They also knew that Nicole and Ron were murdered, but they showed pictures of it during the trial. They also they knew, knew what? I said they also knew Ron and, Ron and Nicole were murdered, but they still showed them the pictures of their bodies in trial. Well, that's a little different. That's actual, no, you know, the, evidence in a murder evidence. case. It's part of the yeah, evidence. Yeah, OJ, OJ not stopping is not equivalent to uh, pictures of a murder scene or bodies. No, but what you said is that the jury didn't need to know about it because they already knew that it happened. That's what you said. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what I'm saying is they it's, knew the murders happened, but they still showed the people that were murdered. Well, so that's because... Knew, 
just because they knew yeah. that OJ yeah. went yeah. on a, a slow speed chase doesn't mean that yeah, they're not yeah. going to be in trial. No, 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 no. But think about what you're saying. They have to show the pictures of the bodies in the murder scene. They have to explain to the jury exactly what happened, where people got stabbed, where the, the injuries took place. They, okay. All they can say about him not stopping is that he didn't stop. That's so not something they need so to know. That's So why didn't they say that? That OJ was not was part of the murder. With- why didn't they say OJ was in the car with a gun to his head and he he brought the he brought them on a on a high speed chase and wouldn't stop if they thought that he was that was part of him being guilty is what I'm asking you because that's not evidence of a murder the pictures but of the evidence, bodies are evidence of a murder no but it's evidence that you claim was part of his guilt so what I'm asking you no. if you think I'm, hold on if I'm, you think that that is an admission of guilt by the way he acted where he didn't stop for the police and he had a gun to his head inside of his car, then how come the prosecutors didn't use that in court? Because you can't get inside OJ's brain. So there's no way to know exactly why he was doing it. Just like you said, it would simply be opinion versus, you know, pictures of a, of a murder scene that are fact. This is what happened, regardless right. of who did it. So then I'm asking the people that are listening, if they didn't use that in court as part of their admission that he acted like a guilty person would where he wouldn't stop for the police and he had a gun to his head and he was threatening to fucking kill himself if that's what they thought was in his head why would they, they prob- have spoken about that in court they probably thought they had enough evidence without the chase well, you, you really put so much stuff like we know never, how yeah, guilty simple as never that. have enough evidence in a case there's no such thing as too much evidence yeah, but again, common. What what would what purpose would it serve when the whole world knows that he didn't stop? What purpose would it serve? I mean, that's not even really a piece of evidence you can present. All you could say is, by the way, jury, he didn't stop when we were following him. You know what I mean? It's not the same as showing pictures of of you know the murder scene and and the injuries that were inflicted on those people. No, but you know, you, so but I'm you just presented saying. It, you presented it as when you saw it and you're hearing that he's in a car with a gun to his head and he's not stopping for cops, that you would have pulled over. You would have never done that because you were innocent. So you wouldn't have acted like this. And if that's what you're going to go on, then you have to ask yourself, why didn't they use that in trial? So obviously they must have well, accepted or understood that that wasn't exactly what was happening that day. And when OJ explained when he was arrested, what really did happen that day, which was that he wasn't running when the police got behind him on the LA freeway, it was because Al Cowlings called the LAPD and said, we're on the 405 right now, headed north, going to OJ's house. So then the cops got onto the highway after Al Cowlings told them where they were and escorted him to his home. And yes, the guy was freaking out. He was being accused of committing two heinous, brutal double murders. He was on medication for anxiety and all that other shit during this time prescribed by his doctors and Bob Shapiro, and he probably wasn't thinking fucking clearly, just like nobody would be that's being accused of a fucking double murder, whether you did or didn't commit it. Yeah, yeah. I don't know, bro. I, I, what, I mean... It's like you said, you can't get in someone's mind. You can, you can, you can jump off the, out the window and say, okay, it looks like he's guilty because he did X, Y, and Z, but he's saying it was ABC. It wasn't used in trial, and if it was, and it was him fleeing or him doing whatever, you better damn well believe the prosecution would have used that shit in court. They used everything else. But, but for what? Because you can't get in his head. It's not like a fact of the case. You could tell it's the jury. Law. Hold it's on. You could. Uh, the prosecutor could only say to the jury, oh, it looks like he was guilty. You can't. The judge wouldn't even let you present that. You don't think the prosecutors thought that him not stopping was just one more sign of guilt? I thought the whole fucking world did. I, I never heard anybody argue that. Well, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a legal principle. That can be used in court. Flight can be used in court as the assumption of somebody's guilt. It's a legal principle. It's done all the time. Just like in the Sam she- Shepard case. You know who Sam Shepard is? You remember the movie uh, The Fugitive? The Fugitive with Harrison Ford? I, I know that name, Sam Shepard, uh, but I don't okay. think I remember that movie. So the movie The Fugitive with Harrison Ford was based on a true story. It was a story about a doctor who was accused of murdering his wife. And in his first trial, he was found guilty. All right. And it was later on appeal that they found out F. Lee Bailey was actually his attorney in that case. They got they got his case overturned and he was proven factually innocent after his trial. Well, when Sam Shepard was first accused of committing that murder, he fled too. He wasn't guilty, but he was accused of committing a murder he didn't do, and he freaked out. 
but but you don't see how it would be seen as a sign of guilt that you're you're running no I, in I, any I, way I just, shape or form i just i just told you yes it can be used in court as a legal principle that people can make an assumption that flight could presume somebody's guilt but they didn't use it in court and it's not a hard fact because i'm explaining that sam shepherd who was also accused of murdering his wife fled and it turned out that he was innocent and he was his court case was overturned on appeal and he was found not guilty so how, how you can't assume but, but how, because what was the proof the way that they're acting why was the not, hold on right. why was the case overturned did they find proof that somebody else committed the murder yes okay all right i, I think flight plus black plus background can you know can, can affect that well i'd like to know what you think of scott peterson then <laughs> well well, here, here no, we are. You'll get him off too. I mean, it's as simple, it's as, simple as this. Retrial, you know what I mean? Whether they I'm used not, it in I'm court right or not, in guilty people run. That's just the way yeah, it works. It's innocent, you know people. What I mean? but innocent people run too. I, I don't know. An example of one. That's one. How often does that happen? You know what Probably I mean? Like, a lot, I, but you don't no. know. We, I don't know every person that's ever been arrested or fled or something that didn't do exactly. So know. we don't know how often that happens. We can't say that's a common no. thing. We could just say it happened in Sam Shepard's case, and if you, in your opinion, no, but, it happened but, in OJ's case. No, but you qualified it by saying that he was acting guilty. Yes. Well, I, but I, I'm I think telling you that right that's not to, an admission of guilt. Is the way somebody acts. That's what I'm explaining to you. I didn't say it's an admission of guilt. It's a sign of guilt. I, that doesn't mean OJ is saying I'm guilty by running. That makes me guilty. I'm right. saying it's a sign of guilt. It's one more Could thing be. that made all the people in this country, the majority of them, believe that he was no. guilty. Well, and I disagree with you because I'm somebody he that could turn around and say I'm scared because I'm a I'm black man and the po police is chasing me. They, they used it in Not the civil case. In Michael, order. trust me. I'm with you on that. In any damn near any case uh, when it comes know, to but I'm just brutality saying, or anything. That's always but OJ, OJ was one of, the, like Common said, one of the most famous people in the world. Right. Probably exactly. the most right. famous black athlete. But he also, what are he the also cops going to do? He also experienced a hell of a lot of racism. Let me ask you a question. You, you, just, you, just, you just said OJ was one of the most famous people in the world at that time, right? Yeah, what the fuck do you dude. think O.J. Simpson was going to go if somebody wasn't going to recognize him? Where was he going to hide? That's why he had the fake beard and mustache in the truck. No, he didn't. That's not true. And it later came out. That's not true. Well, during, during didn't he actually trial, have? Didn't during, he actually have flight plans for later? He had that money. Day? He had money no, too, and he had no, money. No, no, no. We didn't. No, we what does that have to do with anything, though? Well, I just meant that flight part, plans that's part of what they were trying that. to say with him fleeing. That he had a passport on him and he had money on him and he had a fake disguise on him, which was not true. He gave Al Cowlings a couple of checks and money to give to his kids because they weren't going to be working and dealing with all this shit. So he gave the money that he had uh, was uh, like 77 cents in, in cash in coins. It was checks and, and that he gave to Al Cowlings. That was not true. The beard and mustache thing was um, he had a he had a travel bag. That he was at Disney with his kids, and two people testified to it that he used to use uh, these stupid fucking disguises when he would go out in the public with his kids and put them on, and that they would never fucking work, and people would recognize them everywhere. And he's done it. He's done it all the time. It was all testified to in court. I don't know about that. <laughs> it was testified to in court. I'm telling you, it was. You yeah, can look but, it up. Uh, Why didn't they it, use it in court? Why didn't they bring it up in court then? I, but but that's what you say to a lot of this stuff. I don't think that means anything. Some evidence is presented, some isn't. You know what I mean? I don't think it means anything that something necessarily wasn't presented. It, but before a prosecutor tries a case, they have to figure out what's um, uh, uh, what evidence um, is going to have a, an effect on the case, what's important, and then the judge has to decide what's admissible. So they might not present every single piece of uh, of evidence. You know what I'm saying? Right, they only Especially, present stuff. They only present things that, that they think proves their case. So my point is, is if that they thought that him in this Bronco chase was proving some part of him being guilty, they would have used it. If they thought that he had a disguise on him or some weird shit like that, they would have fucking used it in court. And the fact that they didn't brings me back to the point that I was making before. That obviously the assumption you're making 
isn't true. Otherwise, they would have used it, as you just said. Hold on. The prosecutor determines what evidence they think is credible to prove their case. So the things that you're bringing up right now, obviously the prosecutors didn't think was credible because they didn't use it. Give me one second. I'll be back. You guys can go ahead. I got a call. You know what I mean by that? Well. The prosecutors aren't going to have what they think is damning evidence and be like, oh, no, we're not going to present that. We got we got X, Y, and yeah, but we don't need A, B, C, and D. Would that be considered damning evidence? I mean, that 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 maybe if somebody he, has uh, a disguise on them and passports and they think it's fleeing the country. Yeah, that's pretty damning evidence, I would say. But but if, if you have that logical way to explain it away, you know what I mean? Like if you obviously uh, he could away. say whether it's true or not. No, no, not you. I'm talking about no. if, if you're okay and you could explain it away by saying I carry the beard and mustache because I use it when I go out with my kids in public as a disguise. I mean, that's that's not going to that the jury is going to say, OK, well, that sounds logical. So it would be a, a, it would be a complete fuck up by the D.A. to, to you know, what I mean, to, to but even that's but that goes yeah. back to my point that I'm trying to explain that what what is being thought about as him being guilty of having a disguise and a passport and all this shit wasn't that, which is why it wasn't used in court. That's what I'm saying. You're answering, you're answering my, you're answering what I'm saying. Well, but I don't know. There's a lot of cases where not every, we don't know whether it was that or not. We just know what was testified. Was used. To. There's right, a lot of cases, use... you know, and it doesn't necessarily always mean though, it's because they didn't think it won't work. It's just, you, you know, you you have to present the case. And a lot of times when you bring things into court or into evidence, then you have to bring a crap ton of other stuff. Well, why don't we just bring the meat and bones that we have time to explain? Whatever. The, the yeah. trial was the long the trial was the longest trial in American history. It went on for almost nine months, ten months, almost a year. There was no timetable in a murder trial. They could have went on for two years if, if they had, you know, enough time. I don't know. I beg to differ. Uh the McDonald case is still going on. <laughs> the what? Uh the Jeffrey McDonald case. No, I know, but this was nineteen ninety four. This is three right. years later. I'm saying at the time, it's the longest trial in American history. Right. Not now. I'm sure the record was the record was beaten probably a couple of times by now. I'm sure there was a ton of cases that went on for a year and a half, two years. I mean, I don't know off the top of my head, but I know I know there was one. I just don't remember which one it was. But I'm, I'm but but what I'm going back to is that it, it's not like they were on a timetable where it's like, oh, we can't present this bit of evidence because it's going to take an extra day or two. You know what I mean? The burden on the state, they don't, they should not be cut any slack on, you know, proving this, period, in my opinion. Yeah, and if, and, if, and, and the bottom line is, is that everybody has the constitutional rights. We're all afforded yes. that same right to be presumed innocent until you're proven right. guilty in a court of law beyond any and all doubt. All right. Yes. And if you were on trial, you would like to be afforded that same right. So Absolutely. when people come on and we see it happen on here all the time is that, oh, we have a newspaper article or, or we have a story and arrest record and all this paperwork. And we say, oh, I know the person's guilty, but we, you know, they were never charged for it or never convicted of it. Then, you know, you can make your opinion and say, well, oh, I think he's guilty based on X, Y and Z. But if you never heard the other person's story or gave them the right to defend themselves and give them that right of presumption of innocence, then, then what difference does that make then? Then that's not how that's not how our legal system is set up. You know, our legal system is set up that they would rather have 10 guilty people go free than one innocent person be convicted. And thank God for that, because any one of us could be in that position one day and being, and being accused of something we didn't do. We've seen it happen. It's happened all, it happens all the time. There's hundreds, if not thousands of people that have gotten their cases overturned by, by the, um, the Innocence Project, which was actually formed yes. by two of O.J. Simpson's lawyers, Barry Sheck and Peter Newfeld. And they're the ones that are doing the Scott Peterson case right now. So obviously they must have uh, uh, enough evidence in their minds and their beliefs to believe the guy yeah. was innocent. Otherwise, they wouldn't take that case. And, well, and you, asked earlier, you, you asked earlier about the Scott Peterson case. 
And the Scott mm-hmm. Peterson case was based solely on circumstantial evidence. There wasn't any piece of physical evidence that tied him to those murders whatsoever. And they actually had a bunch of Brady material. And what Brady material is, is it's exculpatory evidence. Exculpatory evidence is evidence that proves the innocence of some person, not their guilt. And what they well, found the out thing that kill, that it was hidden. The thing, the thing that gets me about Peterson is they're bringing in the robberies in the neighborhood that were yeah. going on. That yeah, they should. That would they should, but that was already debunked that there were no robbers in the obviously area. Obviously not. I mean, obviously well, no, not. That's not, tr- that's not true. There was there was two guys in a van that had been committing burglaries in that neighborhood in that area leading up to the time of that murder. Right, right, but not on that day. But maybe they didn't commit the burglary that day. Maybe they were in the process of it and they kidnapped her and killed her and shit and, and robbed her. The, but that's they should Brady leave material. No that's stone material. unturned. That's it. That's, that's, you know. That right there. That right there is Brady material. That's exculpatory evidence saying that it's possible that there were these two guys who were committing these burglaries in the area that had a van that maybe somebody saw around the time of her disappearance or where she was dumped in the water. Whatever. I don't know. I haven't studied that case. I know a decent amount about it. And I do know that most of the evidence in that entire case was based off of solely off of circumstantial evidence. Now, I'm not saying that. Well, he's a, I brought innocent. him up because he's another one that went on the run. But here's the thing. He went and dyed his hair and was found with a bag full of money and a passport. So, yeah, because he was doing shit he shouldn't have been doing, but he didn't necessarily kill his wife. Uh, I mean, I'm just also- saying. You could all, if this, that's the thing, you have to play devil's advocate in cases where you have somebody that's being accused of a crime. Oh, no, I mean, up. listen, I agree, just because someone's shady doesn't mean they're a murderer, but, right. you know, but, how many you know, times he, do we He was see, up to no good, whether or not he killed his wife, he was doing bad shit. But well, yeah, how many times... Well, yeah, he was and he was cheating on her, had an affair with that Amber Fry chick or whatever. But I've, he he I've heard you say this yourself, Common, um... There's two. There's certain things that are too many coincidences, you know. Yeah, I don't. I don't believe in, in conspiracies or coincidences. Yeah, I think. I think that things happen for a reason, and when there's enough of them, you put them together. That is most likely, you know. For instance, what I mean by that is, um, the conspiracy of let's say, um, 9/11. I'm not going to get into this. I don't want your channel getting struck or nothing. But let's say, uh, the conspiracy of 9/11 that it was an inside job, and there's, you know. 50 of these things that all happen that are coincidental that would need to happen in order for their theory to make sense. Well, then I don't think it's a conspiracy theory. I think that it sounds like a bunch of weird fucking shady shit happened and there might possibly be another explanation for it. Fair enough. Fair well, listen, enough. hold on. Before we go on, not to cut you off, Jesse, I want to introduce another guest. Uh, sure. he, he couldn't come on with the link, so... Uh, and he said hello uh, to you, by the way, Common. It's, uh, it's Don Berlin. Sure. Give me, can, give me, ten, give me 10, 10, 10, 15 seconds. I'll be right back. Okay. Right. Chris, I got to go, buddy. You're right. All right, Frank. I thank you. For, kid for thank you for the donation earlier, bro. Frank sent me a hundred dollars. Yeah, yeah, everybody, have, everybody have a good week, okay? Have a good evening. You, you too. Take care, everybody. Take care, Common. Bye bye. All right. And let me just say thank you. Uh, Debbie H sent $20 and said for a great show. Loving it. Yeah, guys. Don't be afraid to donate. It's it's kind of a good show. Please donate to this show and this man. He does a great show. Thank you, Michael. Don. Shouldn't have to be said. Yes, sir. I agree, yes, Michael. Sir. And, and I, I concur with that, which is that everybody should donate. I mean, it is a great show, and it's very interesting, and, of course, time, timely, what have you. Uh, what I, I can't see anybody, and I can't... Um, uh, I can't see who's on, but but I just want to say hello to everybody uh, who's on the panel, as well as all of the people who are listening. I tried to work with StreamYard from afar. I'm not I'm not uh, anywhere uh, where I have access, so I can't I can't come in on StreamYard. So I'm just going to be a voice in the uh, in the night. Mm-hmm. But um, what I wanted to say was this, okay? Um, and, and I only caught like, uh, pieces of what Brandon was talking about. And, uh, I, I, without regard to whether or not OJ is innocent or guilty, here's my personal take on it. And, and you got to remember, I'm going to preface this by saying, not only is this my own personal opinions, my own personal views, but they don't reflect anything 
uh, that is the view of any local, state, or federal law enforcement agency or <laughs> any military organization <laughs> or what have you. I just have to say that. Uh, I that you have to say that. Personal, I am, brother. Yeah, it, yeah, these are only my personal views, okay? Yeah. So that's number one. Number two, I want to say that I am, I, I'm, I'm, I come with bias in this respect, okay? Okay. First, um, I have to agree with a lot of what Brandon is talking about because here's the context, all right? I happen to know or knew very, very well two of the principal parties in the O.J. Simpson case, long, long time friends from many, many years ago when I was in law school uh, in the, in the 1970s. And so you understand the context of this. So F. Lee Bailey had two principal investigators. One was Stephen Delaney and the other was, uh, was a guy named Yeah. Yeah. Steve, Steve Delaney. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So Steve Delaney was head of the Boston Strangler squad. He worked on the Albert DeSalvo case later on in yeah. life. Of course, in the 70s, when he and I lived in Hoboken, we formed the firm of Delaney in Berlin. OK, oh. so Steve and I were partners when Lee Bailey was uh, just finishing up the Hearst case and a bunch of other cases. So I knew Lee very, very well. So that's number one. Number two, he was brought into this case for a very specific reason. Yes, OK, yes, he was yes. not originally a part of the dream team. No, Robert no. Shapiro was not a good cross examiner. He knew that. Okay, he he did not have those kinds of skills. Robert Shapiro was well known for making a deal Settle and it. for resolving Settle matters it. before yeah. trial. That was yeah. his yeah. Kind of deal. Okay, yeah. he was not he was not an elegant cross examiner, unlike Lee Bailey. I was on a number of trials with Lee, where literally the guy has a photographic memory. He could he could take twenty pages of transcript with questions and answers and stand before a witness and say, did you not state this on July 17th, yep. 1979 question, and then go, but question, answer, question, answer for 20 pages. And he would be exactly correct without looking hey, at the transcript. It's mesmerizing to watch. Yeah, it. So, F. Lee, F. Lee Bailey was brilliant, man. Absolutely brilliant. Rest yeah. In peace. yeah, absolutely. So when Lee Bailey got the call, Robert Shapiro, he called me. Okay. And he called Steve and he called John asking us whether or not we wanted to come into this case. I was long gone by them. Uh, I was out of that business and, and my career had moved on. Steve took that case. And the thing that Lee said was he was most bothered by the void in the blood. And what he meant by that is exactly what Brandon was talking about. Probably didn't know this story, obviously. But the void in the blood that Lee was bothered by was the fact that the blood scene at Bundy was unbelievable. Okay? And yet you're expected to believe that he traversed, meaning the offender, that would be O.J., traversed to a car, to, to a driveway, to a house, to, to carpets and everything else within a short period of time and left no blood behind in a situation where that amount of blood was involved, okay? That's yep. why Lee Bailey hired Henry Lee, okay, who was head yep. of the uh, Connecticut Crime Lab. That's the reason why, because he was bothered by that, all right? Lee Bailey is best known for cross-examination in cases where there is political or police corruption. That's where he does his best, okay? He doesn't do well in drug cases or in federal, you know, uh, wiretap cases or what have you. He is best known for where the evidence is fucked up. Sam Shepard, Patty Hearst, okay, Albert DeSalvo. Those are cases where he was best known for because the, the government lost its cases over the fact that they fucked up the case. OK, and right. what happened here, what happened here was, again, it's just like what Brandon was saying, whether you believe he's guilty or not is immaterial. OK, but what you do want to have happen is the person who whom is guilty be tried fairly. And when the government, in this case, the LAPD in concert with the LA district attorney's office creates evidence, plants evidence. And the, clearly they did in this case. 100%. 100%. 100%. 100%. 100%. 100%. 100%. 100%. 100%. 100%. 100%. 100%. 100%. 100%. 100%. 100%. 100%. 100%. 100%. 100%. 100%.
Yeah. Okay, there's, there, there's no way it would coagulate from a blood tube could then transfer into a blood drop in a sock, okay? It's, it's ludicrous. On top of that being missing in a video. So we all know that the evidence was planted. McAdder, uh, what's his name? Uh, 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 I can't remember pronounce his name, but anyway, the four of the first on the scene. Brandon, yeah. Oh, uh, Van Adder? Yeah, Van Adder. Van Adder, yeah, Van Adder yeah. was caught in multiple, yeah, he was caught in multiple lies. Yeah, and, you know, I, I was saying, I was saying earlier, Judge Ito at one point during the trial while he was on the stand said that he had a serious disregard for the truth. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, because what they did was they fixated upon OJ owing to the fact, I think, it, it, to be honest, I think for two reasons. Number one, if you remember the Stacey Key case, you know, the four cops that got off, the police burns down, they did not want to have that happen again. OK, they just they did not want to have that happen. They needed to make certain that whatever evidence they got was ironclad. OK. Yep. And the bottom line is whether he is guilty or innocent is immaterial. What is more important is the fact that they went about to set him up and to frame him. Now, they may yep. have framed a guilty person. You may say that or they may have framed an innocent person. You may say that. But I'm telling you. For those who you know want to believe this or not, knowing the parties involved, you know, for many, many, many years, I was invited to, but I couldn't go to Lee Bailey's funeral. He died in Maine at his house yeah. in Maine, mm -hmm. but he he talked about this to me several times about the fact that he was deeply, deeply disturbed over the blood evidence. That was the key thing. Now, oh, can I can I say one thing, Don? The second. Yeah, I just wanted to say too the the second the second thing that F. Lee Bailey and even and he even up until the day of his death um, was staunch on this too is that the timeline was impossible. Yeah, yeah, and that was the second thing I was going to talk about. So the second thing that he talked to at least he talked to me about he talked to Steve Delaney about was that um, and and just to back up a paragraph or two Steve Delaney and Lee Bailey they were from Boston okay. So Bailey's law firm was um, in Boston. He had two partners, Gerald Alt and Albert E. Johnson Jr. Those those were the main lawyers in the Bailey firm. Okay. Steve was then the chief investigator. He was in law school. I was in law school. And then the other guy from John, you know, kind of like ran ran that case and what he had. One of the things that he talked about was this, and he taught us. Okay, this was Bailey's style. Remember, he's a Navy Marine. Okay. Everything with him about yeah. everything about his training was all about timing. Okay. He was always into these timeline analysis. Yeah, he called uh, it forensic forensic timeline. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That was his big thing that he would yep. teach. I mean in the office, you know. That he was always into timeline analysis and he always said the timeline analysis will illuminate the truth. Or will will convict the guilty, one of the two. So right. Steve put together this this um, this animated timeline analysis, and one of the things that he found was that when they found the tape of Mark Furman, okay, and then the coincidental appearance of him, you know, at, on the nine one one call, okay, it just didn't make any sense to Lee. So then they started digging into the tape and how you know that that tape came about or what he had to. And that was the second thing that he knew before the trial even began. This is something that oh. never came out before. Can I, you can I, can I, can I, can I add to that Don? Cause I know what you're talking about and what, yeah. and what Don's referring to is Mark Furman um, was speaking to somebody who was, I believe a screenwriter or playwriter out of North Carolina. Right. And he had right. been speaking right. to this, he had been speaking to this woman for uh, uh, the better half of a decade, about 10 years. And shortly before the trial um, was set, Mark Furman had made a comment to her on one of the tapes that uh, without the glove, the case goes bye bye, meaning that he right. knew he was instrumental in that entire case. And if and if and if he wasn't in the case with that glove, then the, the state didn't have a case against him, which later and um, Don, you can explain the rest. Yeah. So later on, what happens is before what, what never really came out publicly is this. The, the everybody 
was always under the impression that the tapes from the screenwriter came up in the middle of the trial. It's not mm-hmm. true. Okay. The tapes were known by Lee and, and the office before the trial began. The screenwriter's assistant, who is transcribing it, okay, is seriously offended by what's going on, okay, and calls his office. Yeah, and they leaked them. Right. Right. And, but didn't want, didn't want to, you know, give up the tapes because she would be stealing it and what have you. So Lee sends Steve down to the office to talk with the screenwriter and says, here's your choice. Either we'll keep this quiet through the course of the trial. We'll keep you out of this. But here's the subpoena due to stake and for the tape for trial yes. only. The tape right. only. Okay. So they knew about the tapes. So what Lee was doing was carefully plotting away the uh, the landmines around the tapes, okay, until Furman hit the stand. That's why when Lee stands up, no notes, okay, he's not at the podium. If you notice, he's standing directly in front of Furman, and he asks him these these hostile, which he was then a hostile witness, uh, yep. leading questions about whether or not he did or didn't say these words. Well, he obviously, the, by the that N, time, the N-word, the N-word. do that. Right. Yeah, yeah, right. So to end what I, I was trying to, my point that I was trying to make here was that, that Lee was brought into that case for a very specific reason. And that is, number one, he knew the timeline didn't work. Number two, he knew the blood was fucked up because it could not have occurred the way the government had claimed and that they were framing, albeit <laughs> maybe a guilty client, but an yes. unjust, it would right. be an unjust conviction. And number two, he also knew that Furman was a dirty motherfucker, okay? Yeah. And, and let, let me tell you, Lee was much more powerful, colorful than me, so... That's that's basically, and it kind of it, it, it's consistent with what Brandon was saying. You know, the blood never made any sense. You know, it didn't. That's 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 the one thing that I always went back to. And um, when you looked at it and you found out, like you were saying before, and, and like I said, you know, the, the cops probably believed that they were, you know, in, in essence, framing a guilty person because they knew that they had a problem with the crime scene. They knew they had a problem with the timeline. They knew that the lack of, of blood evidence uh, in his car, in his home, whatever, if somebody committed these grisly murders, they knew they had a problem and they needed something, which is why I believe Furman planted that glove and they planted the uh, the blood on the sock and then the, the blood on the back gate. And once, once as you said, Furman uh, set up Furman, because he did set him up, because he knew, he knew they had him on tape saying the N-word and a bunch of other crazy shit, um, that the minute that they did that and they were able to impeach him, that was that was it. You know, they were, they were good up until then, but that pretty much sealed the deal at that point. And, you know... Yeah, yeah, you, you, and you have to look at this thing logically. We're not dealing here with bullet wounds. Okay, you're dealing with multiple stab wounds around the neck. That is the highest area of blood spackling. Okay, blood spray, blood washback, and what have you upon the hands, the body, the arms, the chest, the face of the offender. Okay, because the heart is pumping greatly, and you can't tell me that he would not have been awash with blood. Oh, he's covered, covered in it, covered head to toe. Yeah. Cover, yeah, and and suddenly he goes to the car and it disappears. Okay, it would have been smeared all over the inside of the car, on the outside of the car as he brushed into it. Remember about this logically. This isn't a guy that's just casually walking away, you know, from a scene and then gets in and then changes his clothes, washes himself down completely. Okay, carefully gets into the car and then drives away, leaving not a speck of evidence, DNA, blood or otherwise, other than a coincidental one-tenth, I think it was uh, 0.90 milliliters of blood, which yeah, is less, less than one It was less than one-tenth of one yeah. drop combined of blood in that entire right. car. Right, yeah. right, right. Did that come from a, uh, if you will, a beaker? You know, that's what it was poured from. Or an eyedropper, you know, that's what's more consistent. Uh, well, that, the other thing, it, it, and by the way, that blog, okay, this is one of the things Lee talked about. I mean, when they talked to him about it, no, there was no smearing of the blood, okay? No. So if a person walks up to a car loaded with blood, 
and gets in, he, he wouldn't be leaving behind drops. He'd be, be leaving behind smudges, smears, and sprays. Yep. Okay. There All was right. no cat. There was not a single castaway, a castaway drop on any of them blood, meaning that it, it, it was obviously placed there. It couldn't have been done during the movement of somebody because you would have got, what I mean by castaway is a trail, either depending which way you're walking. They could tell that uh, the murderer walked away, they claim, with the knife in their hand dripping blood because of the angle at which the blood splattered or dropped on the sidewalk, so to speak. And the fact that there was no splatter or castaway on any of these spots is proven that it was dropped down specifically. And I believe it was some sort of eye drop, some sort of beaker type that they used because it doesn't make any sense. They were all perfectly well nah. dropped. Every one of them. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, you know, and then and then the next thing that, that is very compelling is that now he goes to his house, okay? And again, where does he clean himself up? Where does he discard the clothing? How does he get all the blood off of his skin and what have you, and so on and so forth? The one thing that I that Lee talked about was the defensive wound, okay? Was it a defensive wound or was it an offensive wound? That is to say, the wound that was found, you know, on OJ and what he had. That's where the picture gets very murky and draws in a lot of the conspiratorialists. That's, that's what, what spawned all of that, which is where people believe that, you know, um, that actually the person that had the knife in the first instance was Nicole, okay? And that she had the knife and that OJ came a calling and there was a fight and he was the initial victim and then he turned the knife, he, he either turned the knife on her or whomever was with him. Okay, that's what spawned the, that that so-called conspiracy. The reality is, at least according to Henry Lee, was that wound that he had um, may or may not have, and 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 there's no telling here. We really never will know whether or not it came from that knife. Okay, because the knife was never found, um, as, and and even if it were. Whether they could actually connect it to the wound is a different issue. Uh, there are other there are other explanations for how he allegedly got that wound that may not have had anything to do with with that particular knife. Well, uh, he he, and, cl he he cl he, cl he, cl he claimed, and I, I thought that they did a good job in, in proving what he said is that you know upon him getting the phone call from the hotel concierge, they relayed the message when Tom Lane called him at the hotel in Chicago and told him about his wife being murdered that he kind of just like right. freaked out for a minute and he threw uh, a glass, uh, uh, you know, like a, uh, a glass would have like a sifter type glass and he smashed it in the bathroom in the sink. And as he was cleaning it up, one of the pieces of glass had cut the inside of his uh, right finger between the ring finger and the pinky, a small, small little cut. Now, Don, you could, you could probably speak on this and you know, 90, I'd say 99% of the people who wind up committing uh, violent crimes using a knife wind up cutting their hand wide open because as soon as you get blood on your hand, and you have to remember, they claim that the killer lost their gloves during the fight. So that means that he had that knife in his hand. And most of the times what happens is the knife winds up slipping and you wind up cutting your hand and your finger areas in here while you're holding it, trying to right. stab somebody, right. which he right. had, which he had none of. Yeah. Not. And not only that, another way. There's another way. There's said another way. There's, said another way. There's, there's a reason why police always wear uh, <laughs> high grip gloves when they're handling a DWI person or someone that's fighting and what have you. Why? Because they lose the grip on the individual who's who's uh, because of perspiration and what have you. They slip off the individual, so they use these grip gloves to prevent that. Well, when you're involved with knife uh, offenses and what have you, the blood wash back on top of the handle of the knife, okay, can result in your hand slipping off of the uh, knife and then going into the blade itself, and then you right. get these. Uh, excuse me, evidence of offensive wounds on her hands from from the slip. But those slips are typically very deep. They're not just tiny little glass-like cuts. They're deep, deep wounds uh, with, with a lot of blood. Um, but, you know, to, to, to kind of like 
summarize this and what have you, you know, what you're really asking, you know, tonight and, and, and has been gone over over, you know, 30 years is, is this a case of attempted curbside justice? That's really, at the end of the day, what you have to ask yourself. Whether or not the guy was innocent or guilty, were, was this a case of curbside justice that went terribly wrong? And the answer to that is yes, and that's why F. Lee Bailey was hired. That's why Robert Shapiro hired him. Remember, there was there was not a lot of money available in this case for all of the lawyers who were to involved. They was they were being paid fifty thousand dollars a day, uh, including expenses. They had a deal with Barry Sheck, okay, his partner Newland, uh, Robert Newfeld. Kajan, Peter, Peter Peter Newfeld, yeah. No. Yeah, yeah, Newfeld, Peter Newfeld, Henry Lee, all the other experts, and when and what have you. By the time you add all that up, those lawyers were making probably about two grand a day of a ten month trial. Okay, so it wasn't exactly you know a huge payday for for them. All Shapiro, right. Shapiro uh, never even got paid in total, and I don't even think F. Lee Bailey got paid at all because Shapiro thought he was doing him a favor by kind of you know re reinvigorating his career, so to speak, at that time. Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah, you know, Lee was Lee was you know I mean he had problems down in Florida. He was under investigation uh, by the uh, you know the bar association for what he was doing uh, on this big dope case down there. He he had, he had problems in California. He was yeah. on the seventh half of his career. Um, you know, poor guy. I mean. If you're around today, I would have called him and said, listen, you should tune into Chris's Addiction and Recovery Show, because if anybody needs you, it was him. Well, that's, a different, that's, a, that's a different story. I mean, you know, poor guy. He, uh, but in his heyday, I will tell you, um, a more brilliant mind. I mean, he, you know, one of the things he, 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 he used to talk about was his days. You know, he was a naval aviator, but he was also yeah. not only a naval aviator, and, and, a, and a Navy Marine pilot, okay, but he was an ace, okay. Do you know how hard it is to become an ace, you know, a stick jockey ace? And not only that, but he, he could fly, you know, both helicopters and and jets. You know, he flew his own jet for a long time. Um, What's an and, ace? Um, an ace pilot, uh, the top three of his class. Oh. Okay, so when you're aviator class, you're you know you, if you're the top three, you're you're an ace. Fucking man. Uh, so yeah. he he um, he scored ninety nine on his naval aviator final exam. Ninety nine. He had one question wrong. Okay, he would end. He hardly attended class. He would just read the books or whatever. He's a total photographic memory uh, on. Uh, on stuff where, and, and he was mesmerizing before a jury when he was on the top of his game doing cross-examination, which he would do freestyle because he was into preparation. I have never seen anybody that prepared harder or longer or more intensely than he did. That was his thing. And the timeline analysis, that, that was his, that was his deal. Um, He's an incredible guy in that respect. It's sad what happened to him. But, Brandon, you're absolutely correct. And Robert Shapiro called him. They were friends from before, okay? He, 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 was, he, was, he was Robert Shapiro's uh, first son's godfather. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, he, he I think, you know, uh, at the end of the day, was hoping that this was going to be the case that would, you know, that would resurrect his career. And then, yeah. you know, uh, as all things happen in high ego uh, environments or what have you, um, you know, don't forget, you know, Robert Shapiro was always the lead, okay, in the beginning, okay? And then right. he assembled the team. But then, you know, when things kind of like slanted heavily towards Lee, for what he had come up with. He came up with the tapes. He came up with the cross-examination uh, cross of Furman. He came up with the uh, the brilliant idea of putting the, uh, the stenographer, the guy that, the woman that, you know, was transcribing the tapes, you know, serving her with the subpoena deuce was taken because she had the tapes at home and was transcribing them, all right? So they made the deal with her, you know, and, um, and then came up with the idea of working with Henry Lee 
he's the one that got Henry Lee in the case. Um, he kind of, you know, was moving to the, um, the fore, if you will. And I think that caused a lot of, um, of envy and jealousy. Um, you know, I don't think the Robert well, Shapiro appreciated that. Um, well, no, there was, there was another, there was another point. I remember during the trial where there was a, um, there was an article or a comment that was made that uh, Bob Shapiro thought was a slight that uh, F. Lee Bailey put out there, um, you know, basically saying that he didn't think he was, you know, capable of, of handling the case, so to speak, because as you mentioned earlier, he was known as kind of like a fixer, like a settler. He wasn't a litigator by any means. I don't even think he had ever done a, a, a murder trial ever. I don't think he had one ever in his entire career. No. And he took that personally. Yeah. You know, he, he was he, he was an assembler, a networker. He was the guy that you go to to assemble the best of the best, but he would never actually try cases. That wasn't his deal. Okay. And and there are people that are very skilled at that. I mean you can't take that away from him. He he, he analyzed the case, he saw problems that, that were clearly evident in the early going. During the course of the preliminary hearing, as as everybody remembers, the preliminary hearing was as long as the trial almost, but nonetheless he, he saw that and what have you, and based upon all of that, he reached out to a lot of different kinds of uh, elements, people and put the team together. Where it went off the tracks was where one of the horses in the race uh, got 10 yards ahead, okay? <laughs> and, that was, and that was Lee, and he never, never let anybody forget it either, you know, because he was that kind of guy, you know? Well, Don, uh, let me ask you and comment some questions because I want to have some, you know, differing opinions here so you guys can, you know, go back and forth, whatever. Uh, Connie yeah. G said, and I could go through some comments. Anybody wants to give your opinion and have um, uh, Don and Common, I guess, kind of debate it uh, with you, just put it in the chat. But Connie G says, and this is the same thing I wonder. She said, so a random murderer just came upon Nicole and Ron in that small area and knifed them to death for no reason, not buying it. What what is the alternative if it's not OJ? Well, I, I think that you know, with all due respect, um, you can't ask it that way. Let me give you this analogy, okay? So, and Chris, you probably could, uh, shall I say, hypothetically relate to this. So, the dope dealer is selling <laughs> oh, dope, okay? You. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the dope dealer is selling <laughs> dope. Right. Yeah. Four of his transactions, he's dead fucking guilty. Yeah. Dead guilty. Okay? And he gets off. The fifth time, he's absolutely innocent. Had yeah. nothing to do with the transaction. He wasn't there. He didn't touch the dope, didn't grab the money, and had nothing to do with it. He gets grabbed, he gets framed, and he gets 25 years. Is that just? Okay. No. Of course not. That's curbside justice. So I, I can't answer that question that that you were, you know, at. I can't say, you know, uh, what the alternative theory is. Okay. What I can say is this: the government's theory did not occur that way. It, it was not possible for it to occur that way. And what the government did was they said that that's okay. We're going to frame him anyway. Because as far as we're concerned, you know, it's curbside justice. No, I understand. That's what I. Yeah. What do you? What yeah. do? You, what do you think, Common? I, I, I haven't asked you yet. Is there any <clears throat> alternative so to provide? There, there, there. Well, there, there was, there was the alternative. I, I brought it up to you the other night. Uh, I don't think it was yesterday. I think it was the night before. And I brought up, you know, what F. Lee Bailey had said about him and two. Uh, I don't know if they were FBI agents or DEA agents who had told him. Uh, a couple years after the trial commenced, that they were on, they were told by a high level uh, informant, a uh, high level uh, cocaine trafficker, that it was a case of mistaken identity. Because during the trial, uh, Johnny Cochran and F. Lee Bailey tried bringing this up in court, and Judge Ito denied them that right to produce alternative theories on who was culpable for the murders. Um, shortly before the trial, and, and you know during the investigation, they had found out that I, I told you the other day. Um, Nicole had a friend living with her named Faye Resnick, who was heavily uh, addicted to free basin cocaine, which Nicole and many of the people whom she was hanging around with at that time 
in and out of Hollywood and the club scenes were involved in. And she had racked up uh, some really, really big um, debts with a lot of these people. For people that don't know, free basin cocaine is, I don't know exactly what it is, but I know it's like a hundred times more expensive than regular cocaine is. All right. And it's highly, highly addictive. I think it's the shit that um, uh, Richard Pryor was doing, you know? Yeah, uh, free base, well, it is. That's just, it's, it's kind of the name that came before crack. I mean, that's all it really is. You you cook it up with baking soda and water, and that's free base. You know what it's I mean? It's good crack. <laughs> it's good. It's just, it's cooked coke. That's oh, okay. really oh, yeah, good crack. Crack. A, a hundred oh, times okay. more coke so, so, without a doubt. To answer Brandon's question, so they, they had, they were to be paid. Okay, so let me give you the uh, just brief, you know, kind of like background story behind that, so you understand the context. Okay, and then you can make up your own mind as to whether or not you believe that that's viable. So Lee Bailey had um, in the in the uh, mid eighties and late late eighties, or whatever, early nineties, or whatever, he represented a lot of major weight uh, dope dealers down in Florida. Okay, yeah. a lot of them. S- several of them became extremely famous in the identity-based intelligence business. One of which was Hank Asher, who was the who was the creator of a company called originally called EBT, and then it became uh, TLO, and then TLOXB, and then TransUnion, and so on and so forth, and Sison. So he 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 was a multi 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 billionaire, but he was a cocaine pilot. Okay, and Lee was his lawyer. Uh, Lee had many other people. Um, he represented Maddie Badada. Uh, Steve and I were involved with that case in New York. Um, and U.S. versus Maddie Badada, which was a which was a drug case. And we all know about Jimmy's connection with Manny Badada. Um, Manny, the her- heroin case. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. So he represented him with Raymond Brown. Uh, Raymond Brown was a black attorney based in Jersey City. He and Lee Bailey were partners on that one and on another famous case, uh, one of the Dr. X case in New Jersey, uh, which uh, involved uh, a doctor that was uh, allegedly killing patients at the Ordell, uh, uh, with, uh, the Ordell Clinic in Riverside, Whatever, New Jersey, yeah. uh, Riverdale, New Jersey. So, so Lee had a lot of uh, experience involving dope cases. Now, lawyers, unfortunately, in these heavyweight dope cases, sometimes they don't go to trial. Sometimes, obviously, they have to make deals. Lee was not afraid of making a very, very good deal if he could. If he had to flip somebody for the government, they were eternally grateful. If you could read between these blurry lines. Okay, and therefore knew a lot of DEA agents. He had a lot of sources for DEA agents because of his clients that he would do queen for the day agreements with. He would do proffer agreements with and so on and so forth. And we're not talking about street people. No, no, big, yeah, traffickers, big time guys, yeah. Yeah, right, right. So is it feasible that two DEA agents, retired or otherwise, came to him with a high value asset informant and said, this is what we understand. Absolutely. Absolutely. If that, I'm not saying it did occur. I'm not saying it didn't occur. I'm not saying that it's true or not. What I'm saying is I know for a fact that the fabric of his representation during those years prior to the, the Simpson case did include major DEA cases down in Florida in particular. Um, so, is that feasible? Absolutely. But what about the the Faye resident? Like common sense. I wanted him to finish his. Uh, uh, well, well. So what? 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 Don was um, uh, cooperating on was, was uh, the the latter part of what I was going to explain is that um, it was a known fact that they were you know heavily involved in in, in the cocaine, the free basin, and the party scene. And OJ had routinely for years been paying off these debts that Nicole had racked up with uh, with certain drug dealers, so to speak. And shortly before the murders had occurred, um, OJ had been approached at his home with uh, one of his friends, Al Cowlings, who later turned out to be the driver for one-time um, Los Angeles crime-based uh, boss, Joey Eppolito, who I mentioned before was heavily involved in trafficking cocaine with that Sal and the other guy there that were the speedboat guys in Miami. And um, pretty much 
OJ pretty much told them, I'm not paying off, you know, your drug debts no more. I don't want nothing to do with that. And they were trying to blackmail him to get him to pay him. So shortly, shortly before the murders, I believe it was like two days prior, uh, Faye Resnick wound up getting sent to a rehabilitation uh, center, a private uh, rehab center to get drug treatment done. So okay. it was believed, it was believed or suspected possibly as one of the theories of who might have done this is that the people that went to Nicole's home looking for Faye to possibly collect, you know, this debt that was owed, uh, took Nicole, who had a striking resemblance to her, uh, in a case of mistaken identity. And when, you know, Goldman showed up to drop off the glasses that the mother left at the restaurant, might have, you know, gotten to an argument with these guys. He might have thought they had something to do with it. I don't know. I, I'm not saying this is fact. Yeah, it was kind of like a wrong place, wrong time thing. It got out of hand. And there was two people that never even testified during the trial. One of the guy's names was Tom Lang. He had the same name as the uh, one of the lead detectives, Van Natter's partner. But he spelt his last name. I believe his ended in an E, and the other Lang was just L-A-N-G. It's yeah, one or the other. Right. Um, either either way, he... he right. the, the, yeah, the, the other guy was L-A-N-G-E. The, the yeah. other guy. Like Artie. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Yes. And the, the regular detective was just Tom Lang, L-A-N-G, not to get them confused. Right. Um, but he he lived he lived up the street he lived up the street from Nicole and he had he he had been walking his dog earlier that night and he claimed okay he told the police this to the investigators before the trial when they were doing their uh, area you know searching the area talking to neighbors etc he claimed that while he was walking his dog he saw what he believed to be a Ford F three fifty pickup truck a white one parked right around the corner from Nicole's home and he claimed he heard two people arguing and heard a gate slam. And he had a really big dog. I believe it was like a Rhodesian Ridgeback, maybe, you know, one of these large dog breeds. And he didn't want his dog to possibly, you know, get excited or do something while they were out on their walk. So as he heard this argument stuff going on, he called his dog and decided to turn around and walk down one of the other roads. And he's telling investigators that he heard a gate slam, but he he ID what he believed was the truck that the murderers were in. And there was two men there. One of them, he said, was kind of in a crouched position outside of the gate. And another man, and they asked him if he could pick the guys up out of a lineup if he saw them. He said yes, but he said it was not O.J. Simpson. And the only reason that he was never called during the trial, because I believe Bailey wanted to call uh, Tom Lang during the trial, but um, Johnny Cochran at that time was worried that the prosecution might try to turn in the fact that he said it was a white Ford F-350, that it too closely resembled O.J.'s white Bronco. But the, the guy, Tom Lang, um, had owned, I think it was 11 or 12 different Ford model trucks, including a Bronco himself, and was vehemently stating that, in fact, it was not a Bronco, it was an F-350, and said he used to own several of them. But for whatever reason, they decided not to call him during the trial. But that was technically one of the witnesses that might have, you know, seen uh, the murderous car or the two possible perpetrators of the crime that was never called uh, to the stand during the trial. Yeah. So, it, you know, I, my, 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 my issue, my issue with someone asking the question of, you know, well, if it wasn't OJ, who did it? It's kind of like Don was saying, like, I can't really answer that. And I don't think it's fair to fair to ask that because then it's Very like, true. you know, OJ's guilty. You know what I mean? Like, well, if it wasn't him, then who was it? I, I, I don't know. I'm sure if they knew he would have gotten arrested. You know what I mean? Like, but I also don't Not think necessarily. that the cops the ever really tried to figure that out either. They just, yeah, they just honed in on OJ yeah. from the jump, and I don't think they really ever, you know, went down any avenues or, or possibly looked for any other suspects at that point. I think either. that they thought they had the right guy, and yeah. that was it. Never been on you know? trial before. Yeah. The, other, the other thing, Maybe not. Other thing um, yeah. yeah, go ahead. You I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, Michael was just saying there and give a damn. Hey, if you've ever been on in court and try on trial, ever accused of a crime, you would care. Yeah. No, 100%. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, no, and Mike, you're absolutely right. And you should care because you want it. You want, if you want to be found, I mean, if, if a person in this country is to be found guilty, they should be found guilty beyond a reasonable doubt and yeah. to a moral certitude with, with, uh, correct and proper evidence yeah. with evidence which is either made up or planted. So this was, I, I believe, anyway, this is, again, my own personal opinion, mm -hmm. uh, which is what was done 
you know, in this case. Now, I want to go back to something that Brandon was talking about a minute ago about, about Faye Resnick. So Faye Resnick, so Steve, my old partner, told me that Faye was actually un- unexpectedly, okay, but because nobody ever had planned this, there was an intervention, okay, yes, by yes, a yes, yes. and somebody mm-hmm. else that sent her away to this treatment facility in southern Orange County, just south of uh, Los Angeles. And yes. it was, she only would go if nobody knew, okay, or was told. Because because to her, it she believed in her drug-addled mind that it would ruin her career. Well, the fact of the matter is she had no career. But in her mind, she didn't want anybody to know. So she went off to the secret location without anybody knowing it. The only person that knew it was her girlfriend and Nicole. That's all, okay? Now, spin no. ahead a second. So, it, it, as a, well, the ex fiance, the ex fiance, too. Right, right, yeah. So, as I was saying Sorry. before, okay, so people ask, okay, if it's the dope dealer theory, why knives? Okay, here's the answer, in my opinion. This is at least what Lee told Steve, Steve told me. Again, by that, those years, I was long gone. I was out by 89. I, huh? It's quiet. Yeah. So, uh, so back when when Lee was d- deeply involved with doing a lot of this kind of work, and and obviously he was paid very very handsomely, and that's why he did it. Um, he was deeply involved with the Florida Cowboy case. Remember the Florida Cowboy cocaine case, famous case. Yeah. He was involved with that case. All right, those guys were not Mexican cartel people. They were cowboys. They got a lot of their stuff out of South America. They brought them in through a secret route via boats and planes and what have you. Was, was in JC Florida, one of them? What huh? Was JC one of them? <laughs> I don't think so. Oh, stop <laughs> it. I can't I can't it. Okay. <laughs> but one of the things that what one of the things Lee talked about, and he actually wrote about it in, in one of his motions in that case, was the Columbia necktie. Yeah, they brought up the Colombian necktie theory or whatever. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. The Colombian necktie. So one of the things Lee talked about to Steve, who told me this, was that he was that he was most bothered by was why knives? Okay. Why? Because that's what dope why dealers do and collections do to threaten people whom they want a money whom they want a money whom they want money from and for which they're gonna kill silently. Okay, yeah. that's a classic thing that cartel Colombian people were doing during that time period. These gruesome, you know, types of uh, crimes, and that's also why it explains why there are these multiple gash wounds around her neck. That's the kind of thing they were doing, and with the decapitation attempt and what have you. So, to the original view yeah, can I, can about I, who did it, okay, I mean, is that a viable theory? You could you could argue that. But there are there are many other theories that are equally viable, okay, that you can talk about as well. All right. But it is a fact that Lee had very, very good contacts at DEA and they had high value assets who were informants. But how many times I mean, you have to temper this with the following reality. You know, how many informants lie for a reason? Okay. So, you know, yeah, they may have stated that as a fact. But is that fact true? And did they lie about it in order to get some kind of right. a deal? Because it was the biggest case going at the time. So you got to temper that with, you know, the ultimate source of that information. So that's why I say don't get too excited about it. Gotcha. What were you going to say, Common? No, well the, well, the other thing, too, was is that, um, you know, when somebody uses a knife, you know, Jesse, I brought up earlier that, it, you know, it's oftentimes, you know, you know, up close and personal, so to speak. And yeah. in, in, in the defense of um, in the defense of OJ, um, I had brought up, and I'm sure Don sounds like he knows a, a great deal about the trial himself, which is I'm glad to hear because it, it makes my life a little bit easier explaining some yeah. stuff. Um, but I brought this up the other day, and uh, Don is, is aware of, I'm sure he is if he still uh, remembers, he's up on it. But the original coroner that uh, that did the autopsies, I believe his name was Dr. Golden. Uh, I'm not positive on that. I might have the name wrong, but I think that was him. Um, when, when they did the original autopsies on the bodies and he testified during the preliminary hearing, 
uh, he stated on the witness stand that he believed from the autopsies of examining the bodies, the medical examiner, that there was two perpetrators and two different knives that were used um, to kill both victims, meaning that there must have been two killers. And uh, when they went to trial, uh, they never uh, used the, the coroner that did the medical examination. They used the head of the coroner's office, a guy whose name was Dr. Lakshmanan. And when he was on the witness stand, Bob Shapiro got him to basically admit that in the 30 or 35 years of him being a, a head of the coroners in, in the field of doing autopsies and, and testimony in these trials, uh, how, how many times has the person who, who done the autopsy and medical examination of the victims that's been available to testify at trial, but you, you've instead testified on their behalf? And he said, I've never done that before. Well, the reason is, is because unlike the person who did the original autopsies that had the two knives and two killers, a theory based on his medical examinations is that that went directly against what the prosecutors in the LAPD wanted, which was OJ Simpson was the sole perpetrator that carried out these crimes by himself with one knife. And that's what Dr. Lakshmanan wound up testifying to. So then you have to ask yourself again, once again, if, if they were so certain on OJ being uh, the sole perpetrator of these crimes and this one knife was used, then how come the original medical examiner who did the autopsies on the bodies in the preliminary hearing stated that he believed there was two knives used and that there had to have been two perpetrators? So they never called him during the trial. Now, when you combine that with the fact that we've seen uh, evidence in this case, including most of the blood that was discovered, most of the damning blood, I should say, that was discovered, uh, contained EDTA, the anticoagulant that is not found inside the human body, you have to ask yourself why. You know, it, there's just too many inconsistencies and too many problems with this entire case to sit back and say without a shadow of a doubt that you know that OJ's guilty. Because the bottom line is, I don't believe that that's the case. And I think that they proved it during the trial. Regardless if, you know, the general public or, or middle America thought it was some type of jury nullification and that, you know, it was a black jurors that let the black guy go away. I don't buy that for a second. And I think that that's an easy cop out that the prosecutors and, and, and the LAPD wanted to use. So they, they didn't have to take blame for bungling and fucking up this entire case from the start. Oh, yeah. yeah I mean, you know, well, they, were, they were seriously intimidated by, uh, by the high profile nature of the case. Of course, it all began with the, with the slow chase, the slow roll chase or what have you. But to, uh, to uh, Brandon's point, you know, so why... Um, why did they switch the uh, the medical examiner or the coroner uh, and absent him from the trial? So enter Alan Dershowitz, okay? So what was his role? So Alan Dershowitz was, uh, when Robert Shapiro started seeing that he was getting adverse rulings in motions in limine, which means to limit evidence to, from coming into evidence at a trial, okay, in the preliminary hearing as well as in the pre-motion stage, he started to see that Judge Ito was was uh, making what he felt were errors in the in the in some of the preliminary motions. So he decides, okay, we need an appellate lawyer right at the uh, right at the defense table to set up. Okay. Hello. Well, we lost them. I think we did. Oh, shit, we lost FBS. Not just Don. Well, we got Don. No, no, no. I, I just got to go do something. <laughs> oh, hey, Don. I'll be right back. I, I, Is Don there? I, I think Don's on his uh, cell phone. Oh shit! I, Does he know that? I can't. I I can't take myself off the screen because then they lose you too. Go ahead, Don. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, you know, somebody else wants to go and uh, and then you need to go and come back. Just tell me, a stop yapping. No, no, no. Go ahead. You're good. No, it was okay, only that right. I left no. the screen for a second so they couldn't hear you. But go ahead. Oh, I see. Oh, Don't I'm, leave me in I'm, charge. Um, yeah, right. So my my point is is uh, is that um, uh, that 
uh, Robert Shapiro started to see these these rulings that were troublesome and what have you for the purposes of the appellate record. Okay, the, he didn't have enough to do an interlocutory appeal, which means basically an appeal before a final order can be issued. In other words, in the middle of a trial. Okay, you can't appeal something in the middle of a trial unless it's something very significant that's going to change the course of, of a trial. That's called an interlocutory appeal. You can't you can't do that normally, except in the most exceptional of cases. Um, uh, is that permitted? So you have to you have to make certain you protect your record. But the best guy to do something like that is an appellate lawyer if if you can afford that. So. The greatest appellate lawyer of his time, you know, that argued more cases before the U.S. Supreme Court than anybody would obviously have to be Alan Dershowitz. His number one thing that he was concerned about, that that Lee was concerned about, was they were trying to get Ito to give them a missing witness, an absent witness instruction. So what does that mean? Okay. Where a person purposely absents themselves at the direction of the government from trial, the jury can infer from that that the purposeful absention of that witness is to be inferred negatively against the government by doing that. In other words, if someone has relevant testimony to give at a trial and it's going to be admissible evidence, which clearly this would be, Okay, he's the very guy that did the autopsy. So therefore, his evidence is going to be uh, admissible, barring relevance or materiality or whatever. He clearly is going to be a relevant witness. And yet the government keeps him off the witness stand. The defense can move the court for an instruction to the jury that he has purposely absented himself from the trial and to infer from that against the government's interest that that is something that is bad, okay? That's a typical appellate maneuver that you do. Yes. Dershowitz. That's why he was brought in. Because, not, not because of Nakasone, uh, the, the one that actually testified. It's the one that didn't testify, that should have been there to testify, and, and that he had exculpatory evidence. And yet they purposely kept him off the witness stand. That, you know, under the California criminal... Uh, uh, procedures uh, for uh, for evidence in a uh, absent witness, it, it, you clearly could get a negative inference instruction by doing something like that. So that's why that was that's why Dershowitz was in that case. Yeah, yes, absolutely. If you've been an appeals lawyer. Had they had lost the uh, trial, he would have had those uh, uh, motions to to set forth for a possible appeal for a new trial. Which they probably would have gotten if you know, had he been convicted. In all honesty, I mean, they had the two, two, two of the main, two of the main detectives got found pretty much a committing perjury on the stand, which is not bad enough, you know. Yeah, well, that that really turned the, the trial upside down. I mean, God, you know, how many times does something like that happen, where the main witness is called, okay, um, testifies, you know, on direct examination, okay. They then close direct. He's subject to cross. They then close cross. The tape comes out. They recall him to, mm -hmm. to open up the door again with regard to the tape. And he pleads the fifth. Okay? Yeah. So that's well, a sanctionable act. Okay? Because then, and which is what the defense was arguing, then if you plead the fifth in that circumstance, the court can then strike all of his testimony and probably would because how do you get a fair, if you will, trial where all that evidence is brought before the jury by a guy who later pleads the Fifth Amendment having, you know, uh, pled it because he feared self-incrimination against perjury charges, which, by the way, ultimately occurred. You yeah. know, I mean, talk about an appellate issue. That's a big one. And, and one of the and one of the one of the best questions that F. Lee Bailey asked him on that recross examination uh, was, uh, "My last question for you, Mr. Uh, Detective Furman, is: Did you plant any evidence in this case?" And instead of this guy saying flat out no, he said, "I plead the fifth. I couldn't believe that. Right, right, right. That was right. incredible. You know, you know, yeah, yeah. Why wouldn't I, you just you know, say no? That's what he was. 
uh, you know, and, and that that's, I guess, my whole point about it, about what I wanted to, you know, chime in and, and say tonight more than anything else was just to give kind of like a sense of the color, if you will, of the defense team and why they were put together the way they were and why... You know, while it came out on television as being Perry Mason moments, it really wasn't. It was all actually planned out long before uh, you saw it on TV, okay? Because one thing Lee Bailey is not, and that is he was not a Perry Mason. He didn't. He would never take those kinds of risks. He was actually a very conservative lawyer when it came to risk-taking before a jury anyway. Guys, get these people to fucking donate already. Jesus Christ. Come on, guys. Hey. Put on a great show for you. Been on here for what? Two, two over hours, two hours, I believe. Get it, yeah, two hours. Yeah, two I got <laughs> zero I got zero super chats. Uh and I'm not cheap. Oh, O C twenty yeah, no, no, he's not. <laughs> o C twenty dollars for great show, bro. Thank you very much. Debbie, I believe I thanked you earlier. Twenty dollars for great show, loving it. And let me just see, I got one other one here. And uh, Kat in the beginning of the show, too, donated. And uh, Shane, Smith, uh, Shane Smith, 624. Let me see. The work Henry Lee did on Michael Peterson's case, uh, Mike, uh, Michael Peterson's staircase analysis was disgusting. What's that about? Well, uh, say that again. The st- on the what? The work Henry Lee did on the Michael Peterson staircase analysis was disgusting. I'm assuming that might be for Don. I'm not sure. No, not for me. I'm not a Michael Peterson. I mean, uh, on, are you talking about Scott Peterson? Uh, Michael Peterson. Maybe he's just making a statement. I don't know. You guys can can go back to uh Let me see I'm if they. I'm not ahead. sure what he's talking about. I'm not sure either. Come on now. Uh, BMS said. I think he's talking about a different case. I think he's talking about a completely different case. Yeah, I think he's just talking about the guy, uh, Henry Lee. I think he was just making a point about him. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's all it was. Gotcha. Does anybody have any questions or anything? You know, feel free to ask. They started talking about that case where they donated FBS. (laughs) Yeah. No, yeah, guys, ask your questions. Ask your questions because these guys will answer. If you have a, you know, conflicting opinion or something. I'm, yeah. I'm just, uh, I'm just glad, I'm glad I have somebody else on here. Or 28 about, you know? memberships yeah. for answer starting now. What is it? Go ahead. That hard. I said it's it's going to be twenty dollars, okay, yeah. contribution from FPS or twenty memberships to the program per answer for my end of the oh, action. Nice. And Brandon <laughs> for his own. <laughs> Joe Bag of Donuts, five bucks. Thanks, bro. Thanks, Joe. Appreciate it. Well, I I figure I know why uh, Jeff didn't show up. Oh my god! <laughs> I, can't, I can't say I fucking blame him after this. You I love too. you, Jeff, but sorry. Yeah, Jeff, I was going to work that well for you. I, I was kind of. I was kind of. I'll be honest. I was kind of, you know, disappointed that he wasn't going to come out. I mean, I wasn't going to like, yeah. you know, try to, you know, be rude or whatever. Yeah. I just. I just thought he, you know, he has a true crime channel, and the way he was speaking, he, he seemed like he knew about the case and wanted to have a discussion about it. So I was kind of a little disappointed. I should say I don't know why he wouldn't show up, but that's you he know. knew his boundaries. I I reckon. <laughs> yeah, somebody had something earlier. Let me see. Let me go through here because I feel like you guys might have something about Doctor Fong or something planning blood evidence. Uh, so, so, somebody broke up. Doctor what? Uh, Do- Fong or something planning blood evidence. Well, Dennis Dennis Fung Dennis Fung was one of the criminologists that worked for LAPD that did a lot of the handling of the um, collection of the evidence at, at Bundy and at uh, OJ Simpson's home, and he pretty much uh, he got the dest- I'll put it to you like this: Dennis Fung got destroyed so bad on that witness stand that when they were done cross examining him, he hugged and thanked the defense team for for uh, stopping their uh, uh, questioning, so to speak. That's how bad it was. I'll put it to you like that. No, I mean, they okay. caught the guy. They, they caught the guy making so many mistakes that were directly against the handbook that the LAPD used in order to um, collect evidence, and he pretty much broke every single one. 
And I, I told uh, the other day a little bit about, you know, the cross-contamination with the, with the blood evidence is that when they went back and they tested the, the reference tubes from Nicole Simpson and, and Ron Goldman, they found O.J. Simpson's DNA in the reference vials. So, you know, any, any blood evidence at that point is null and void because you can't, you can't use that when there's cross-contamination. The, none of your results are going to be truthful or accurate because, of course, the blood's going to be there. You mixed up their reference vials. And got them contaminated with the with the suspects or alleged suspect in this case is a DNA. Oh, so man. that's pretty bad. I, I can't remember, Brandon. Was it? Wasn't it? Uh, I, uh, I think it was, wasn't it Barry Sheck that uh, cross examined Fong. Yes. Was it Newfeld? I can't remember. No, it was it was Barry Sheck. He destroyed him. Barry yeah, Sheck had that infamous moment. Well, people don't know that, Barry Sheck. Barry Sheck later found it. Uh, as a result of the Simpson case, okay, he founded the Innocence Project. The Innocence Project basically deals with DNA that is discovered years later and has resulted in, I don't know how many to date, but it's well over 200 convictions in many yeah. of the capital cases and several death row cases. Bereshek was responsible principally along with a uh, the chief investigative reporter for the Chicago Tribune. His name is William B. Crawford Jr. He was the guy that found out about multiple death penalty cases were set up and uh, contained bad DNA. It resulted, oh. the Innocence Project and Northwestern University resulted yes. in the death, pay, the death penalty in Illinois being abolished, okay, followed by several other states. That all was as a result of Barry Sheck's work with the Innocence Project. And and he got, uh, he, he was very experienced with regard to nascent DNA, you know, by the time the Simpson case started. But it was after the Simpson case that yeah, he right. really became, you know, very, very concerned about what he learned in the in the Simpson case and the mishandling of DNA and of blood evidence and forensic evidence and what have you. That's what spawned him creating the Innocence Project, which he, I think he is still the chairman of, uh, although he's probably very close to, if not re retired. But uh, Fong, unfortunately, fiddled and fuzzed and... Uh, at the end of the day, you know, uh, it was the, the manner in which the chain of evidence was kept in this case was just like abominable. I mean, there were so many different breaks in the chain of evidence and the handling of the blood and the forensics that it just made prosecution of this kind of case in a fair way virtually impossible. Um, uh, that, you really talked uh, about Van Adder's role. And what he was fucking around with the blood vials over the head. We haven't really talked about that. Yeah, that's that. We, we can talk about that too. That's another important part when you know he when OJ uh, agreed um, to give his uh, blood. Uh, uh, Van Adder took that blood from the LAPD uh, uh, headquarters and brought it to the crime scene, which was later determined to be missing about uh, two milliliters of blood, which just so happens to be the it, the total amount of blood discovered between uh, Nicole Simpson and OJ's home. So the, the person that I think you're referring to is Roger Martz, if I believe his name correctly, who was uh, the special agent who worked for uh, the, the feds in, in regards to the, the DNA at uh, their main office there in Washington, who got uh, found falsifying and um, trying to incriminate people they thought was guilty by, by, by falsifying the DNA uh, analysis and cases and testified to. And was later determined, uh, you know, to be doing it corruptly, and and yeah. uh, you know, securing convictions for people that were innocent because they planted the evidence against them. So, yeah, yeah, it was a huge scam with the FBI lab and what have you. Um, and then there's another major case that's going on right now. I, I don't remember the name of it, and uh, where there are uh, several hundred uh, DNA related cases which are at jeopardy. Because of the same kind of you know you know issue, and mm -hmm. in, that, in that case, it, it is the manner in which they were uh, testing the the DNA, not so much chain of evidence, which is the Simpson case. It's the manner in which they were corruptly uh, testing the, testing the DNA, coming up with results that were not correct. 
uh, and it was a woman. I can't remember. This just came out in the last several weeks. I, I read about it, uh, believe it or not, in the Jerusalem Times. Um, obviously, they were getting it, you know, from maybe AP or someplace. But nonetheless, uh, um, uh, I don't know that that was one of Barry Sheck's, you know, situation with the Innocence Project. But it just the only point being is, is today's modern day DNA. Okay, and the Innocence Project and all of these capital cases all really stem from Barry Sheck's work in the Simpson case, which is a lot of things that people forget about today. Yeah. Well, listen, I got a question for you. Patrick Hayes, though, first, 199. OJ should have confessed on his deathbed. Thank you. Uh, Bobby, Bar uh, Bobby Barbarian, $5. Thank you. Joey Dimes, $5 for great show. Thank you. And Anonymous sent me $50. Thank you very, very much. Now, here's a question for you guys. Uh, Joe Bag of Donuts said, if the droplets on the sock weren't found after the first test, were they planted after the test? And if so, by who? It wouldn't be after the test. It would be before um that, that, that question is a little conflated i mean brandon can you answer that better than me because yeah so, I don't so have basi that. basically what happened is that um when they sent out you know the evidence that was obviously discovered at oj's home the sock was one of the pieces of evidence um they used ultimately to try to uh say you know oj was the murderer when they discovered um what they claimed to be nicole's dna on a, a drop of blood on the sock but what happened is they didn't allegedly discover the, the blood droplet on the sock until two or three months after it had already been processed by two or three different independent uh, forensic laboratories. They didn't claim they didn't see the blood. They must have missed it. Now, I don't know how you're going to miss a big drop of blood on a sock when you're literally doing that as your job. And it's only until a few months later that the blood drop is discovered. And it was they were caught. Um, I believe it was Van Adder that was caught on record making a statement that he knew that it was Nicole's blood that was on that droplet uh, about a month and a half before they even found the blood on the socks. So how the Ooh. fuck did he know that? And then when they did discover the blood drop and they tested it, that's one of the, the blood drops that contained the EDTA from the, the reference vial, which uh, they later determined was missing uh, two, two of the eight milliliters or two of the eight cc's of blood that was withdrawn from the person who took OJ's blood. And one of the problems is, is that the individual who had been taking, uh, you know, blood samples for the police department for the better half of, I believe, like 30 years uh, had testified during the preliminary trial that he that he drew eight cc's of blood from OJ's arm. But when they went when they went and they got the reference file, the defense to do their own testing, they saw that there was only six milliliters of blood in the reference tube. And they later got this guy not in the court, not on the witness stand but at his own home on a videotape uh, saying that he must have misspoken and didn't know how much blood he actually withdrew, but it was enough. So <laughs> that's, you know, that's, that's just another, you know, a piece of the puzzle that makes you sit there and scratch your head and say, well, what the fuck is that all about? That, that, that That's not good. That shit reminds me of the Stephen Avery case, the fucking, the blood. Yeah. That, yeah, a In lot. a lot of ways. Yeah. Yeah. Making the, making the murder thing. They planted that shit in that fucking girl's uh, fucking yep. SUV or whatever. That's fucked up. Well, I, I I think at the end of the day that the LAPD, the detectives, whatever, you know, were, were, were sure in their assumption that OJ was guilty. They knew that what they had, you know, didn't make sense. It wasn't enough. So they felt as though they probably needed to frame who they thought was oh, a guilty yeah. man. And unfortunately, in essence... You know, whether he is guilty or innocent, your personal opinion, the bottom line is, is that, you know, he was framed. There was evidence that was planted. Lead investigators and cops involved in the case committed perjury and lied on the witness stand. And, you know, the defense team, uh, you know, uh, uh, fortunately for them, had, had enough money and resources to defend himself because and nobody else uh, besides OJ would have probably or, you know, didn't have his kind of money to, to be able to hire a team like that. Um, you know, would have had a fair trial, honestly, or, or had the ability to even do any of this, uh, you know, uh, research or discovery on their own. And so, they probably would have been convicted, you know. So does anybody know how much of a relationship OJ had with his defense team afterwards? 
Yeah, so that's a very good question. Um, so basically what happened was the defense team splintered for uh, reasons that I kind of touched on before in the sense that while they, they grew close together, you know, if you will, geophysically during the course of the trial because they were forced to be so, um, their relationship with one another was never the same afterwards. Um, Barry Sheck and Peter Neufeld continued on their own, Correct. okay? But Lee uh, Bailey and Robert Shapiro never really talked much after that. Lee then got himself into more troubles and more problems and what have you, and, you know, many of uh, his friends or whatever, frankly, walked away from him. Um, Johnny Cochran, <coughs> who uh, became, frankly, the nominal head of the team, okay, um, grew closer to Lee Bailey and further away from Robert Shapiro. Um, and, um, of course, Alan Dershowitz went on uh, to, you know, become uh, more involved with the, uh, with at Harvard Law School and what have you, um, and really got out of the trial business and mo mostly stayed involved with, with major appeals and what have you. But, you know, was likewise close to uh, uh, a lot of them. But make no mistake about it, bottom line was <clears throat> that, um, that the defense side, the defense team, if you will, be grew apart. Now, with regard to your other question, you know, you know, what was OJ's relationship? Clearly, he and Johnny Cochran remained close. And he and Lee Bailey remained very close, but not so much with uh, with the with the others. Uh, which he, which he was he was close with the uh, Kardashian, right? He, he 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 was friends. He was friends with Kardashian. He was friends with Kardashian for years. But he, actually, when that when that murder uh, took place, um, they, they were on the they were already on the outs previously. Their their relationship was already tainted years before that from some okay. business dealings that had went sour. But okay. um, yeah, but, Which but a lot Bob, of people don't know that. Well, yeah, yeah. And a lot of people don't know too that that Bob Kardashian actually, although he was an attorney on paper originally. He hadn't been a practicing lawyer, and I think over like a 10 or 15 year span, he was actually involved in the music industry and stuff like that. Wow. And the only reason why he was on that defense team, because, as, as, you know, if people do or don't know, he didn't do any of the, you know, cross examinations or any of the actual work uh, involved yeah. in the actual court itself. He was right. kind of like the liaison between OJ and, and the rest of his defense team. He, right before the trial started, um, pretty much went back in and re, re got his law license. Like he, um, he renewed it uh, oh, shortly wow. before the trial so he could be there. And I also think they did that too. So they would avoid having Bob Kardashian possibly be, you know, a witness or having to testify or do anything like that. If he was, you know, part of his, uh, uh legal team from whatever he may or may not have said to him, uh, you know, pre-trial. I mean, so, if you look also, Bob Kardashian's role really was the business person, okay? In, right. in the, he was the guy that paid the bills. He managed the business yeah. side of the litigation, which was enormous. He managed the relationships between the client and the rest of the and rest of the team. Remember, he was the only person that really knew and was friends with OJ in the beginning. OJ right. did not know. Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, knew of him or whatever. He didn't know, you know, Barry Sheck or, or you know, um, uh, Peter Neufeld or the other guy. I can't remember his name off the top of my head. But nonetheless, the the older guy with a mustache and white hair. What was his name again? I can't remember. Peter his Neufeld. Name. White. Peter Neufeld. Huh? Peter Neufeld. Say it again. Peter Neufeld. No, not Peter Neufeld. There was another guy that was there for a while. I can't remember. His name, but anyway, um, so so Robert could ask for for OJ. Yeah, for OJ, he was. I can't, I can't, I can't hear you. That good. are you talking about Robert Blazer, Bob Blazer? Yeah, yeah, that's it, that's it. Yeah, yeah, Bob Blazer. Yeah, yeah. 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 So, yeah, so Bob Kardashian was kind of like is what Brandon said. He was kind of like the liaison because he was his oldest. He was his older friend or whatever. And he knew him for many years, and that was their line of communication. 
The other thing about whether or not he was conflicted out, I don't know that that's necessarily true, um, that he would have been conflicted out because of uh, uh, because of his personal involvement, or what, and they had to keep him on the case for that. Because if that were true, frankly, the government would have simply conflicted him out by move to disqualify him. Wow. So I don't think that was the case. I think what the reason was that he was in the case was because he was the liaison between the client and the team and kept the team together um, consistent with the client's interests. And he made certain that the client's interests, as he was told during all of his meetings with him, was well understood by the team and that the team would execute his wishes, whatever they might, you know, whatever they might have been. I think that was his primary purpose. He didn't have any, you know, Robert Kardashian, needless to say, was not a Clarence Darrell, you know, I mean... <laughs> He, he he was he, he was a show lawyer, you know, for the most part. Let me just read. I want to read something I think is, you know, kind of hilarious. I put this up on the screen earlier, but I want to read it. Bobby Barbarian said, I still think OJ did it. Knife killings are personal. He was humiliated for having a freak wife, and she brought that shit home. Most powerful men would do the same thing. I'm glad he got away with it. <laughs> Great statement. <laughs> Uh, this is a great show. It goes. It goes back to the. It goes back to the thing about the um when Jesse first asked about you know the the accusations of domestic violence that you know turned out to really be a a, a sole single incident that they blew out of proportion. But it goes back to the saying of you know not all people who are domestic abusers wind up killing their wives, but most people, most right. men who wind up killing their wives are domestic abusers, so to speak, you know? So, yeah. you know, those things to me are, you know, one of the, you know, mutually exclusive type of things. And I just think that a lot of that stuff that they used against was just blown out of proportion because, you know, uh, maybe people do or don't know, but one of OJ's dearest friends, Marcus Allen, who was a running back who played for the chiefs, you know, really famous running yeah, yeah. back in the hall of fame. And, um, and the Raiders. Was, and the Raiders, correct. Uh, he was actually having an affair on his fiance Kathy with Nicole Simpson, and he told OJ about it. And even after OJ learned about Marcus Allen having this affair with his ex-wife Nicole, he still held Marcus Allen and Kathy's wedding at his home and remained Just friends. Just a whole so, other you know, fucking plateau to this. Yeah, so when when people are saying that this guy was this jealous maniac that, you know, would fly off the handle if he found out right. anybody was with his girl, his best friend was having an affair with her. And and OJ was on record stating that he was just upset that Marcus was going to ruin his relationship with his fiance Kathy over it. He wasn't, you know, pissed. He didn't not be in friends with the guy I talked to him any again. So th wow. there's just a lot of stuff like that that people just don't know about, you know. I well, definitely got a lesson tonight. That's yeah, what's, um, what's this... Um... About the NDAs thing, he had to before his kids could visit him in the hospital. He made them sign NDAs. Why? What do you mean? That was because, yeah, well, for two reasons, I think. You know, uh, in my opinion, anyway, for whatever it's worth, I think number one, he did not want to have any photographs taken of him that would depict him as anything less than his strong and usual way. Okay. His, his, oh, you. I, I'm. Uh, I'm sorry. You guys mean like when he when he just got sick before he passed? You're talking about? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Sorry, I was confused. I don't know what you meant. My apologies. Go ahead. Yeah. So I think that's one reason. Uh, number, the second reason was that you know remember he got burnt badly uh, through his own actions actually in the memorabilia case, and what he did want to have happen was you know, post-death, have the same thing will happen all over again, which was that people would be profiting over uh, memorabilia to wit, things like taking pictures of them and selling them and that kind of stuff. I, I think that he was concerned about that. Uh, and then, of course, the third thing was, and this was mostly a medical directive, he he said in his, uh, in his will, uh, it really wouldn't be in his will, but in, in his medical directive, that he did not want his brain to be donated to CCE research. <laughs> yeah, and I think uh, part of the reason for that is because of the implication that people would possibly make yes. uh, that uh, he was so you know damaged by CCE that 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 would make him guilty. 
Okay. The thing that, I got that problem. That is that. Okay. And that that if they found significant evidence of the presence of CCE going back then, and we all know that CCE can manifest itself with violent can manifest violent tendencies. So Well then all NFL players be fucking killers. Well, yeah, I mean that's true. You know. I mean, um, you know. But, yeah. Well, it, it is it is true that a lot. If you look at most of the the cases that wound up, you know, high profile case in criminal court across athletes, most of them are actually from the NFL. I mean, you look at cases like Ray Lewis's, you know, when he was on trial for that stabbing murder, yeah, the Junior Seau case. Yeah. You know, there's there's been several, and they've all pretty much been from you know football player Hernandez, the Hernandez yeah, trial. Uh, you know, God, so I can under, I can understand why he was worried. Yeah, about that, you know, because yeah, at the end of the day, this, was, this guy was worried about his image. He had an image, you know, as right. tainted as it was. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, very true. Um, and the reason why that um, the the, the other possible reason is curious. He asked that. That's actually an excellent question. Probably one of the best ones from tonight because it it does have on his face such an oddity. Why would you make your own children sign an NDA? Here's what I also you have to also consider: if the children were to take photographs of OJ, okay, that would have an intrinsic asset value post mortem. All right. The Goldmans could then come in and seize that asset from the children because it's a part of the estate. Well, did you, yes. not, not to interrupt. Did you oh. hear that these did you hear that these animals, the Goldman family, is going after the children and his estate right now? Can you believe that? Well, yeah, well, and you know, I I, I have to tell you, um, you know, forget about this kind of case for a moment, okay? Forget about that. Just from my experience in um, money laundering uh, investigations, but not <laughs> in the context of criminal. Where does it end? How, how you know organizations do money laundering or whatever, cycling of money. Okay, so one of the things that you have to always remember about money laundering or conversion of assets is the longer the amount of time that goes by, the deeper the laundering occurs, which is to say it makes it very, very, very difficult to detect and then identify and then and then uh, uh, seize assets that have gone through multiple cycles of laundering. Forget about, let me just give you a, a, like a broken analogy. So if you put, you know, your laundry in a washing machine and turn it on, okay, and it cleans, cleans your laundry, and then the cycle is over. And then you re-launder again with more soap. And the laundry is the second time, a third time, a fourth time. Well, any chance that you're going to be able to find the original dirt after four or five, six, seven cycles, okay, of washing that laundry is nearly impossible. Same thing in a organized, you know, money laundering case. Simpson has had 30 years the estate, his executor, his trustees, or whatever, to export, exfiltrate, and move his assets. Hold on, Don. Uh, Common has to leave, so. Uh, okay, okay. Common, thanks yeah. for coming on. I'll talk to you later, bro. I appreciate you, man. Hey, Common. All right, yeah, definitely. Great sorry, evening. Sorry. Thank you for your Sorry, effort. I got to run, guys. Uh, yes, thanks for having me on. I, I hope everybody uh, enjoyed the show, and those of you who can uh, uh, donate uh, for us tonight. I've been out here for, I think, about three hours now. Um, yeah, Don, man. it was uh, good talking to you. Appreciate it. And, um, you know, hopefully we'll do it again, some other topic or, or moving forward. So thanks, guys. Right, Take man. care, Michael. Yeah, uh, I got to work myself, too. But just my last point here, and that okay. is that I have zero confidence that they will ever recover anything from either the children or the estate. Zero. Really? Uh, because, because, because of the assets have been well... Uh, you know, well concealed by now. If they exist, and I'm not saying they do, I, I don't know. But if they do exist, you know, for them to try to recover them, extremely difficult. They'll spend a lot of money on it, and, and who knows if they'll ever get it. Last, last thing I just want to say, and I, and I want to leave on this point. <clears throat> you know, at the end of the day, uh, and this was my whole point 
from why I even came on the show. And that is just to say that, that when you try to commit curbside justice and frame guilty people, okay, the jury system does work. It does work. They found a person not guilty, maybe because he wasn't just not guilty. Maybe they found him not guilty because of what they heard in the government's case that demonstrated that they did it unfairly. And, and, and that's what you've got to come away with. That the jury system in this instance did work because of the manner in which the government presented its case and how they collected the evidence. So that's, that's my takeaway. Gotcha. Yeah. Maybe you should do your job, guilty or not. Yeah, how about that? All right. With that, take care, everybody. God bless. Have a good weekend. Stay safe, stay strong, stay sober, and stay out of uh, out of trouble. All right. Have a good one, Don. Bye-bye. Talk to you soon. All right. Well, Michael, that's it. Thank you for staying up here with us, bro. I appreciate it. Absolutely, you. brother. All right. I'm going to end it in a second. Thanks, man. See you. Uh, here, I'll take you off. There you go. All right. Yeah, Common, thanks again, man. And Don and Frank and uh, Jesse and Miss Can't Be Wrong and Michael, everybody. Thank you, guys. This was a, a great show. I did make it, make it public, uh, you know, probably somewhere around the middle uh, just because I wanted to get the chat going and stuff. But um, I'll put it back on members only, you know. Um, I want to thank you all for being here. Hold on. Let me. The fuck did I do with it? All right. Yeah, I want to thank you all for being here and watching and anybody who donated. Thank you very much. There wasn't many of you, but hey, take what I can get. Uh, I'll be on tomorrow at some point. We'll talk about some mob tube shit. Most likely we'll roast a motherfucker or two. You could probably guess who. And um, that's it. I'm out of here. Thank you for everything. I love you all. And until next time, salute.